During an ominous night, a cup of tea and a beautiful man lie on the floor. A woman coldly stares at the man. She orders the knights to get rid of the crown prince. For her beloved's sake, she has committed an injustice. The woman then walks away from the bloody room full of dead bodies. By committing such treason, the woman thinks that her beloved will be happy to be a king. She enters the throne room with anticipation. The red-haired man sitting on the throne asks her for updates. She mentions how she got rid of crown prince Alponso. The man smiles, and his laughs echo in the throne room. He tells Ariadne that she did a great job. Ariadne sweetly smiles. Now that the cleanup is done, the man plans to make Ariadne the noblest woman in the kingdom. Ariadne feels happy that Cesar said that. She hugs him, thinking that this is for the best. She can be happy alongside her beloved Cesar. After the coup d'etat, Cesar became the Etruscan kingdom's regent, and nine years quickly passed by. Ariadne also fulfilled her role as the head of the palace's internal affairs. However, despite her efforts to fulfill the duties of the previous queens, people still talk about her humble background and call her unqualified as a noble. The nobles wonder when Cesar will marry Ariadne. Rumors also say that Cesar can't marry an illegitimate child. Despite those rumors, Ariadne believes that Cesar loves her. Ariadne suddenly hears that Cesar is a concubine's child and that he is actually Alponso's half-brother. A countess claims that a half-breed can't receive the blessings of the heavens. Ariadne snaps and attacks the countess who said it. She tells her to badmouth her instead of Cesar. Cesar wonders what is happening. Ariadne smiles at him, but Cesar runs over to the noble instead. The noblewoman then talks badly about Ariadne. Ariadne can't believe that Cesar didn't run to her rescue instead. Cesar grabs her and tells Ariadne to do the work properly. He claims that the Countess is more useful than Ariadne. He tells her not to act shamelessly, or he won't make her his wife. However, more years pass by, and Ariadne is still a fiancé while Cesar has another woman. One night, Cesar forces himself on Ariadne. Ariadne thinks she will now be Cesar's wife. Just then, Cesar mentions that Isabella will be the queen, making Ariadne shocked. Ariadne pushes away Cesare and points out that Isabella, her sister, is Alponso's wife and is an impure widow. Cesare claims Isabella has remained pure throughout her marriage. Ariadne insists that her sister is impure and had a miscarriage. Cesare glares at her and exclaims that women's enemies are also women. He calls Ariadne an inferior woman, and Ariadne can't believe what she just heard. Ariadne cries and mentions how Cesar promised her to be his wife. Cesar then mentions that Ariadne is inferior compared to the noble Isabella. Ariadne now realizes that Cesar has been in love with Isabella since the start. Cesar laughs while claiming that Isabella was meant for him from the beginning. He was mortified to be engaged to Ariadne. Ariadne falls as she realizes that she is just a replacement. Cesar chuckles and claims that she is not even worth being called as a replacement. Ariadne exclaims that she helped with the treason and even sacrificed her ring finger. She gave up everything for Cesare. Cesare turns his head and calls for someone to lock up Ariadne, who has turned crazy. Ariadne gets dragged away and locked up in the West Tower. Ariadne recalls how Cesare tells her how she resembles lily flowers, pure and obedient. Ariadne can't help but smile. She wakes up from it and realizes that today is the coronation ceremony. Cesare has been officially crowned king. Ariadne should have been beside him. Just then, someone comments how beautiful the valley's lilies are, but the roses in the garden are far more precious. Isabella asks how Ariadne's sleep went. Ariadne angrily asks what is between her and Cesare. Isabella tells her not to talk badly about her husband. Ariadne apologizes for what she did with Alponso. However, Isabella was talking about Cesare as her husband. She claims that she is meant to be the most glorious woman in the kingdom. She calls Ariadne shameless for trying to be the queen. She claims she experienced a lot of bad things, especially the miscarriage rumors, and she wants Ariadne to take responsibility for them. Isabella wants to make Ariadne pay for everything. Ariadne angrily asks why her sister is doing this. Isabella claims it doesn't matter who, but she wants someone who will make her the most glorious woman in the kingdom. Ariadne despairs as she deeply loves Cesare, unlike Isabella. She blames her sister for ruining her love life. Isabella laughs out loud and claims that Cesare knelt before her. Cesare told her how he thinks of Isabella while embracing Ariadne. He also commented on how Ariadne's figure resembles a man's and Isabella is way more petite and fragile. Isabella asks if there was ever a man who wanted Ariadne. Ariadne realizes now that she is just a replacement. Isabella teaches her sister not to hopelessly devoted herself to a man because they don't know what gratitude is. She claims it is better to raise their value themselves to make men swoon over them. Ariadne falls to her knees, thinking that Cesare has left her. 
However, Isabella knows that Cesar will also get tired of her and remember Ariadne, who was faithful by his side. Knowing that, she plans to kill her own sister so there will be no problems in the future. Ariadne gets stabbed from behind and is killed by her own beloved sister. The bleeding Ariadne finds everything unfair. She wonders where everything went wrong. She wishes to turn back time. She remembers the golden commandment, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Ariadne wishes to have a life like that and wonders why she can't. A voice asks her if she can live by the golden commandment. Ariadne confirms that she can do it without a doubt. Ariadne opens her eyes and discovers the place where she used to live. She notices her small hands and checks the mirror. She returns to her younger self. She notices a mole she didn't have before. A woman appears and tells her to get ready for work. Ariadne swears to protect herself this time. She won't stand still anymore. The maid keeps shouting at Ariadne and calling her the daughter of a lowly servant. Ariadne grits her teeth as she hears what the maid says. Another maid comes and exclaims that someone came to take Ariadne back. Ariadne remembers that this was the day when her father called her back. Cardinal de Mare was indeed a cardinal but had a wife and children, unlike the others. The cardinal can't leave his wife and let an aristocrat, Lucrezia, be his mistress. Lucrezia behaved like the cardinal's official wife and had three children who received the same treatment as the first wife's children. The second daughter, Isabella, is hailed as the most beautiful woman in the city. However, the cardinal also had a child with a servant, and that is Ariadne. She was kicked out for being the child of a lowly servant and living on a farm. Ariadne later arrives at the cardinal's mansion. She meets her father, who is sitting menacingly in his office. They glare at each other, and the unfilial daughter expresses her joy at seeing her father. The cardinal stares at her and is glad that Ariadne has grown well despite being uneducated. Ariadne apologizes for being lacking and swears not to embarrass the cardinal. Someone agrees on the side, and it is the haughty mistress. Lucrezia warns Ariadne to be graceful as a woman all the time. Ariadne always thought of Lucrezia as the standard but she looks no different from a lowly person. Ariadne knows how to make Lucrezia bitter in front of the cardinal, and she menacingly smiles. Ariadne bows to her and claims to be her best daughter, as she said. She respectfully calls Lucrezia a lady, like how the servants address her. A confused cardinal asks Lucrezia the mistress gets flustered and asks Ariadne to call her mother. However, Ariadne calls her ma'am instead. Just then, someone arrives at the cardinal's office. Ariadne gets goosebumps as she hears the person's voice. Isabella welcomes Ariadne back to their family. Ariadne backs off as she feels creeped out. The sisters look at each other. Ariadne has always thought of Isabella as the perfect sister. Isabella had always had a beautiful smile, and that very smile stabbed Ariadne in the back. Ariadne won't be cowardly this time. Isabella reaches out her hand as she tells Ariadne to call her sister. Ariadne puts up a poker smile, and she thanks Isabella. The cardinal is happy to see the sisters getting along. He really likes it. Ariadne and the others go out of the cardinal's office. Lucrezia reminds Ariadne not to cause any trouble. This woman, Ariadne hasn't done anything yet. Someone then screams as she refuses to have Ariadne as her sister, who grew up on a farm. Arabella points out how Ariadne is a lowborn. Before, Ariadne couldn't rebut, but she now knows how to break their spirits. Ariadne teases Arabella that their mother and father like Isabella more than her. Arabella gets mad and pushes Ariadne. However, Arabella's expression darkens as she sees Isabella down the stairs and in pain. Ariadne actually dodged and had Isabella get pushed instead. Arabella is scared of what she did. The cardinal comes out shouting after hearing the loud noise. Arabella gets flustered and points to Ariadne as the culprit. The cardinal immediately lashes out at Ariadne. Ariadne apologizes and claims that Isabella was protecting her. The two sisters are both surprised by Ariadne's words. Ariadne then tells their father that Arabella was joking around and pushed Ariadne down. Arabella starts exclaiming that she didn't do anything at all. Ariadne claims that she might be uneducated, but she doesn't lie. She then tells their father to ask Isabella. Isabella hesitates to answer. Ariadne wants her to her true colors. Isabella claims Arabella was just kidding around and asks their father to forgive Arabella. Ariadne smiles, seeing Isabella do a great job. This is a chance for Ariadne to be a good sister to her bullet half-sister. Arabella runs toward Isabella, who asks her to be careful next time. The cardinal then calls out to Arabella and punishes her by locking her in her room for two weeks with bread and water only. Arabella tries to plead that it was not her. The cardinal then extends the sentence by a week seeing that Arabella is talking back. Servants help Isabella be treated. 
The cardinal looks for Lucrezia as Arabella still claims that it was not her. Ariane watches everything as the cardinal shouts and Isabella leaves. She smirks at how easy this is. Days later, Isabella refuses to get married to a rumored illegitimate child. She reminds her father that they should elevate their status. The cardinal put down his glasses and claimed that he also knew about the rumors. Cesare is officially the cousin of the crown prince but is actually the king's bastard son. The cardinal also doesn't want his daughter to marry such a person. Lucrezia then suggests marrying illegitimate children and naming Ariadne for the betrothal. The cardinal finds the suggestion tempting and menacingly smirks. Meanwhile, Ariadne fully accepts the fact that she went back in time. She swears not to make the same mistake this time. She wonders what to do to prevent her betrothal to Cesare. She thought of marrying someone else or running away after getting rich. The latter option is the best choice for her. As she crosses out the option to marry, she knows there will be no happy ending for her where Cesare falls in love with her, and they live happily ever after. What she experienced was the opposite. She feels angered by her memory and wants Cesare to pay for what he has done. Just then, a maid enters the room, bringing some clothes for Ariadne. Ariadne recognizes her as Isabella's personal maid, Maletta. Maletta orders her to get dressed and join the family dinner. Ariadne claims Maletta must be busy because she is not helping her get dressed. Maletta laughs at Ariadne and claims that Ariadne is old enough to dress herself. She further claims that Ariadne had no maids for her on the farm in the first place. She turns around as her head starts to ache. Ariadne taps Maletta's shoulder and slaps her out of nowhere. Ariadne tells Maletta to know her place. Maletta gets mad and exclaims that Ariadne is also a peasant maid's daughter. Ariadne's expression darkens. Maletta further exclaims that Ariadne is not even a nobleman's child but a clergyman's, while the other two ladies were born to a noblewoman. Maletta then wonders if the cardinal got her pregnant, her child will be at the same level as Ariadne. Ariadne raises her hand and slaps Maletta so hard that she falls. She claims that the slap was for insulting her father and her ugly bout of jealousy. She warns Maletta to watch her tongue and tells her to get out. As Maletta runs away, Ariadne feels the worst about being hit by her reality. She grits her teeth and swears not to let a man sway her life again. In order to become independent, Ariadne needs to cultivate her own power by finding an ally. Just then, Lucrezia, Isabella, and Maletta enter her room. Lucrezia gets mad at Ariadne for hitting a household member. Maletta acts like the total victim of the event. Lucrezia shouts at Ariadne, who is calmly facing them. Ariadne bows and claims that she can't hold herself back after Maletta insulted her father and Lucrezia. Everyone listens as Ariadne shares what Maletta uttered before her a few minutes ago. Maletta tries to make a point in front of Lucrezia. Ariadne adds that Maletta mentioned how the cardinal is of common stock. That is why Maletta doesn't want to serve Ariadne who was born a peasant. Lucrezia will take Ariadne's side because the cardinal's bloodline is a delicate matter. And for the finale, Ariadne mentions how Maletta imagines getting the favor of the cardinal and carrying a child with the same status as Ariadne. Lucrezia looks like she is out for blood. She grabs Maletta's hair and speaks with ten lashes. Maletta asks for forgiveness while being dragged away. Lucrezia then tells Ariadne to approach her instead of not being ladylike and striking a servant. Ariadne apologizes for losing her composure. As atonement for her behavior, she offers herself to be banished for three days in the Rambulet shelter, surprising Lucrezia. Ariadne also asks to bring Maletta with her so they can make amends and gain the maid's faith. A flustered Lucrezia claims that the shelter is too much. Just then, Isabella suggests five days of atonement instead, smiling brightly. Ariadne gets creeped out and agrees with her sister while wearing a poker face. The next day, a carriage arrived somewhere. Ariadne gets out of it and sees the hopeless condition of the Rambulet shelter. While the trembling Maletta watches her, Ariadne looks around. As expected, this is the perfect place to hatch her plan. Queen Margaret, King Leo III's wife, founded the Rambulet shelter to aid the poor. However, the allocated treasure for this cause was meager, resulting in many peasants who entered the shelter perishing. Ariadne and Maletta both entered the shelter and encountered exhausted peasants. Ariadne couldn't contain her joy when she saw Maletta trembling in fear. Startled, Maletta turned away. When Ariadne called out to her, Ariadne further taunted Maletta by informing her that Isabella could no longer protect her. If Isabella had spoken up for Maletta, she wouldn't bear any scars on her back. But Maletta could only avert her gaze from Ariadne. Still chuckling at Maletta, Ariadne planned to join the rest of the peasants. Maletta, terrified of the shelter, remained unaware of Ariadne's plan to make her completely subservient. Ariadne walked, actively searching for someone, with Maletta closely following and trembling in 
fear, surveying the area, Ariadne noticed numerous peasants on the brink of death and remembered that the person she sought resided in the shelter. In the distance, a woman with red hair called out to her sister. Ariadne and Maletta stopped. Upon hearing the voice, Ariadne smirked menacingly and asked Maletta if she saw the little girl. With red hair, Maletta played coy. Ariadne then squeezed Maletta's shoulder and whispered, asking if she recognized her own little sister. Maletta's expression darkened, and she could only cover her mouth. Ariadne threatened Maletta, stating that if she didn't comply, she would leave her in the shelter to perish. In that case, Maletta would be reunited with her sister, and they would both die. Together, Maletta clenched her teeth but refused to admit it, continuously asking for forgiveness from Ariadne. Her expression was one of complete terror as if she was about to wet herself. Ariadne grew serious, grabbing Maletta's shoulder and asking if she was implying that Ariadne was lying. Maletta's expression worsened when Ariadne grabbed her face and demanded an answer. Upon touching Maletta's face, Ariadne felt a surge of electricity. She saw a vision of a person wearing a white robe who asked Maletta and her sister, Sancha, who was smarter and more hardworking. They could only choose one of them. Maletta's sister replied that they were raised together and promised to work hard, pleading not to be separated. Maletta stared at her sister, growing angry. She shoved her and asked the person to choose her. Instead, Maletta claimed that her sister, named Sancha, was too frail to do real work and accused her of being a petty thief. The person, showing a faint smirk, took off her hood. It was Isabella, and she chose Maletta to work for her. Although Maletta was thankful for being chosen, Sancha felt saddened and called out to her. Sister, Maletta immediately grabbed her head and warned her to stay quiet. Maletta explained that one of them had to work so that they could both survive. She told Sancha to stay quiet and be patient. The vision ended when Maletta joined Isabella and left the shelter. Ariadne gasped for air and felt dizzy. Maletta offered help, causing Ariadne to freeze up as if seeing a ghost. Ariadne was confused about what she had seen, unsure if it was a hallucination or a vision from the past. Ariadne clenched her hand and walked towards Sancha, intending to confirm if what she had Scene was true. Sancha, looking malnourished, asked if the person she was seeing was Maletta. Ariadne knelt in front of Sancha and inquired about her well-being. To confirm her suspicions, Ariadne asked if Sancha had an older sister who worked for a wealthy household. Sancha was surprised and immediately nodded. Ariadne continued, asking if her sister had told her that one of them had to succeed for both of them to have a better chance in life. Sancha couldn't believe that Ariadne knew what Maletta had said. Ariadne couldn't believe it either, that her suspicions and the vision she had seen were true. Ariadne stood up, thanked Sancha, and urged her to take care of herself. Sancha begged her not to leave and expressed her desire to speak to her sister. Sancha explained that she hadn't spoken to her sister since she left for work. Hearing this, Ariadne wanted to confirm if her sister had never contacted her. Sancha confirmed that it was true, and it was the first time she had seen her sister since then. Ariadne examined Sancha from head to toe and asked Maletta if what Sancha said was the truth. Maletta, sweating profusely, couldn't give a straight answer. She replied that she had never seen Sancha in her life before. Sancha's expression darkened, feeling abandoned. She grabbed Ariadne's clothes and begged for her help. Ariadne instructed Maletta to bring the shelter's manager. Two days had passed since they met Sancha. Ariadne sat outside, leaning against a tree, starving. In a flashback, when Ariadne met the manager, she requested more food for Sancha. The manager declined, stating that they couldn't afford any special treatment, even if she was his eminence's daughter. Ariadne understood and proposed an alternative. She sacrificed her own ration of meals for the day and asked for it to be given to Sancha. Ariadne felt weak, wishing only for Sancha to have a day's worth of meals, but it had already been three days. Ariadne was still puzzled by what she had seen before. It seemed like a part of Maletta's memories. Ariadne attempted to touch Maletta's face again, but nothing happened. Ariadne concluded that the vision required more than physical contact. Lost in thought, she was startled when Prince Alfonso reached out to offer her an apple. Looking up, she was surprised to see him and realized he was asking if she was hungry. Ariadne's expression turned to terror as she remembered killing Prince Alfonso. She quickly regained her composure and accepted the apple, realizing she hadn't sinned against the prince. Yet, accepting the apple meant accepting a new opportunity in her life. Despite the suddenness of the situation, Ariadne saw it as a great chance to get to know Prince Alfonso. He had heard a rumor that Ariadne had been giving her meals to a sick girl in the shelter. After eating the apple, Ariadne felt relieved after three days of fasting. 
thinking about what to say to make a good impression. She responded to Prince Alfonso. Ariadne felt warm inside and chuckled when Prince Alfonso complimented her. They both understood the importance of food and rarely gave it away. Ariadne explained that she only gave away the bread because it was inedible, lacking milk and butter, which made the texture coarse. Prince Alfonso smiled and sarcastically asked if the bread from the shelter was really that bad. They had a wonderful conversation, but Ariadne knew she shouldn't confess that she knew his true identity. Prince Alfonso asked how long she would be staying and she replied only until the next day. He then asked if she would continue giving away her food. Ariadne hadn't planned on it, but since she was able to eat an apple, she imagined she could last another day. Prince Alfonso was happy to hear this answer. He then took out delicious snacks from his pocket and gave them to her. Ariadne was surprised at first but realized that this might bring her closer to him. She accepted the food but had to bid farewell to the prince. Prince Alfonso felt disappointed, knowing their conversation would end so soon uncertain of when they would meet again. Ariadne had to leave it at that for now. Before departing, Prince Alfonso asked for her name. She smiled and told him her full name, Ariadne de Mare. Seeing her smiling face surrounded by beautiful flowers, Prince Alfonso couldn't help but show affection. Ariadne returned to the manor with Sancha after completing her punishment. They were immediately confronted by her stepmother, who thought Ariadne was playing a bad joke. Before her stepmother could do anything worse, Isabella rushed towards them and noticed the prince's initials on the handkerchief Ariadne handed her. Isabella recognized the initials right away. Ariadne explained that she had met the prince at the Rambouillet, thinking he was inspecting the place since the queen oversees it. Ariadne had only wanted to take care of Sancha's health, but instead, the prince entrusted the child to her care. She didn't want to refuse the token and insult her father's good name. Her stepmother was still angry, considering it inappropriate to bring a peasant into the manor. Without permission, she asked if the prince had also asked Ariadne to insult her stepmother. As they were about to be kicked out, Isabella intervened and offered to intern at the Rambouillet. The mother slapped Isabella, stating that such a place was not fit for a lady. Isabella requested for Sancha to stay and promised that if she were to meet the prince at a party, it would be a perfect story to appeal to the family's benevolence. An argument ensued between the mother and daughter, which was part of Ariadne's plan. All Ariadne needed was for Sancha to work at the manor. Lost in her thoughts, Isabella snatched the handkerchief and thanked Ariadne for her help. Ariadne realized that nothing had changed and clenched her hand. She understood that anything she had could be taken away on a whim. Sancha expressed gratitude for Ariadne's help and swore to repay her kindness one day. Ariadne patted her head and thanked her. After a few days, Ariadna's family received an invitation from the queen. Her stepmother and sister could only guess the queen's intentions. Ariadne, looking from the stairs, felt disgusted, since, in her previous life, neither of them was ever invited to the palace. Arriving in her room, both Maletta and Sancha were inside, informing Ariadne to get dressed as a carriage from the palace had arrived for her. Surprised by the invitation, Ariadne glanced at the bed and saw her clothes. She smiled mischievously and asked Sancha to try on her outfit, just for fun. According to the sacred scripture, Saint Gon of Jessarch was revered for two martyrdom acts. In his first martyrdom, he died alone and was shunned by those around him. However, he performed a resurrection miracle and sacrificed himself again to prevent a catastrophe in the realm. Only then was Gon of Jessarch praised by the people. The nobles of San Carlo enjoy church sermons about St. Gon's second sacrifice. But today's sermon mainly focused on his first sacrifice, spoken in the language of Gallico Kingdom, Queen Margaret's homeland. Ariadne assumed that Lucrezia, her stepmother, and Isabella didn't understand a single word of today's sermon. Ariadne knew Lucrezia lacked refinement, and Isabella had recently started learning Gallica. Ariadne noticed a person from a distance, assuming it was Queen Margaret. She remembered only seeing the queen in portraits in her past life, but she could already tell by her dignified air. As the sermon was about to end but still in Gallica, both Lucrezia and Isabella said amen out. Loud, drawing attention, people started whispering to each other, admiring Isabella's beauty. Isabella complimented the queen for requesting the sermon about Gone of Jessarch's martyrdom, sharing that it was one of her favorite passages from the scripture. Proudly, Lucrezia asked Isabella which part was her favorite. Isabella expressed her love for the second sacrifice, confusing Ariadne as the sermon focused. On the first sacrifice, the people in the church were surprised by Isabella's interpretation and whispered about her immaturity and envy of the saint's fame. 
Ariadne saw that Isabella would make their entire family a laughing stock. She immediately shared that her favorite part was the saint's act of courage, explaining how she understood his fear of facing death yet still bravely confronting it. People around Ariadne showered her with compliments. She felt relieved, thinking that what she did was probably enough to save their family's reputation. As they left for the lobby, the queen noticed Ariadne, recognizing her knowledge of Gallica. The queen was introduced to the wife and daughters of Cardinal de Mare, the person Ariadne least expected, who had insulted her former fiancé in her past life, complimented Isabella's dress. The woman inquired about the dressmaker, and Isabella mentioned their family, seamstress. Upon hearing Isabella, the woman scoffed and insulted them, suggesting the seamstress might not of the time and pointing out the difference in outfits between Ariadne and Isabella. Lucrezia felt insulted, as the woman brought up the illegitimacy of Ariadne. The woman stated that children shouldn't be blamed for their parents' transgressions. Isabella replied that Ariadne had been suffering from ill health and had recently returned from the countryside. She added that their seamstress was working hard to prepare appropriate clothes for Ariadne. Isabella explained that she had lent Ariadne her own dress for the time being, attributing any misunderstanding to her taste in clothing. Ariadne realized Isabella's intention but still followed along. When Ariadne stood up and turned to show the dress, her dirty chemise was revealed to everyone. This was part of Ariadne's plan to humiliate Isabella. Not only was Isabella questioned about the clothes she supposedly owned, but also her mother and how she treated her daughter as less than a common maid. The queen silenced everyone and asked Isabella if the chemise once belonged to her. Isabella couldn't answer directly. The queen noticed Isabella's lies and asked both Lucrezia and Isabella to return home. Ariadne felt satisfaction as Lucrezia was treated like her father's mistress. The queen instructed a helper to escort Ariadne and provide her with a proper chemise. Ariadne was caught off guard by the queen's words. As Ariadne followed the helper, she realized the place was familiar since she had stayed in the palace for nine years as Cesar's fiancé. Closing her eyes, she accidentally bumped into the helper and overheard her greeting someone. When Ariadne saw Alfonso, both of them were surprised to see each other once again. Upon seeing Alfonso, Ariadne quickly composed herself and acted as if it was her first time. Needing him as a prince, matron Carla, a trusted attendant of Queen Margaret, immediately warned Ariadne about her manners. Matron Carla introduced Alfonso with his formal title as the sole scion of King Leo III and Queen Margaret, Alfonso de Carlo. Ariadne suspected that the queen would be aware of her interaction with the prince. Ariadne greeted Alfonso again, this time with better manners. Matron Carla and Alfonso argued because the prince wanted to keep his title a secret from Ariadne. Alfonso enjoyed being treated as a friend by Ariadne, which angered matron Carla due to their different social statuses. While staring at Alfonso, Ariadne realized he resembled a rebellious youth. However, when their eyes met, Alfonso smiled faintly at her. He grabbed Ariadne's wrist and happily dragged her to a garden, concerned they might be followed. Alfonso suddenly let go of her hand. Ariadne laughed at his reaction and teased him about treating him as his highness to avoid any offense. Embarrassed by his actions, Alfonso suggested that Ariadne continue calling him his highness. Since they didn't run away, Ariadne proposed using secret nicknames instead. Alfonso was surprised by the suggestion, thinking it might be rude, but Ariadne explained that using his name openly would reveal his true identity. Ariadne knew that the idea of a secret connection would be tempting, and eventually Alfonso agreed. Annoyed that her previous suggestions had been turned down, Ariadne grabbed his hand and wrote his nickname, Dire, with her finger. Alfonso didn't react, just stared at her, and then clenched his fist, confessing something to her. Ariadne realized she was probably summoned to the palace because of Alfonso, as he had informed the queen about their encounter at the Rambulit shelter. Thinking Alfonso was oblivious, Ariadne was surprised to discover that he was aware of what was happening. Alfonso understood that the queen kept an eye on her because she cared for him but felt suffocated. Realizing he had been expressing his frustrations, he apologized and wanted to change the subject. Ariadne surprised Alfonso by caressing his head and showing concern for him. She excused herself to avoid matron Carla's anger, leaving Alfonso unable to respond, his face turning red as she departed. At the manner of Cardinal de Mare, Lucrezia was seething with anger due to how the queen treated her. Her tantrum caused a vase in the manor to break, 
and she insulted the queen, calling her a filthy wench from Gallico. When Ariadne arrived home, she greeted her stepmother, which further enraged Lucrezia. Lucrezia accused Ariadne of being two-faced and claimed that the chemise she wore was another one of her schemes. Ariadne knew that Lucrezia might be dense, but her instincts were sharp. Ariadne refuted the accusations, stating that the chemise she wore was her only one. Lucrezia became even angrier and demanded to see Ariadne's caretaker. Lucrezia ordered a search of Ariadne's room to ensure she wasn't hiding any additional chemises. Faintly smiling, Ariadne knew there were no other chemises in the room, no matter how thoroughly they searched. She thought of another plan to silence Lucrezia's accusations. Suddenly, Maletta announced that she knew who the real culprit was. Ariadne became scared since Maletta was present when she executed her plan and forgot to silence her. Maletta informed Lucrezia that she knew who the culprit was and placed the blame on Sancha. Both Sancha and Ariadne exchanged glances, unsure of how to react. Lucrezia swiftly grabbed Sancha's hair, accusing her of theft. Maletta reached into Sancha's bag, retrieving the chemise, and presenting it to Lucrezia. Though relieved that she wouldn't bear the blame for her scheme, Ariadne remained furious and struggled to process the situation. Despite enduring a beating from her mistress, the kind-hearted Sancha denied the accusations. In a state of panic, a red dot appeared beneath Ariadne's eye, pulsating incessantly. Her ring, finger wouldn't stop twitching. A voice spoke of the golden rule, warning that one must pay the price for their wrongdoings and reap rewards for virtuous deeds. It questioned Ariadne's betrayal of others and profiting from their suffering, while lamenting her own sense of betrayal. Ariadne felt bewildered, unsure of whose words she was hearing. Lucrezia, still enraged, brandished a sharp object and moved to stab Sancha. Ariadne's pleas fell on deaf ears as Lucrezia advanced, prompting Ariadne to leap forward and shield Sancha, resulting in her being stabbed in the back. Surprised by Ariadne's selfless act, Sancha immediately inquired about Ariadne's well-being. Ariadne implored Sancha to tell the truth, but Sancha refused. Observing both of them, Lucrezia concluded that Ariadne and Sancha had conspired to mock her. Just as Lucrezia was about to strike them, the cardinal arrived, attempting to defuse the situation. Ariadne whisked Sancha away to her room while her stepmother and father argued. Overwhelmed, Sancha panicked upon seeing Ariadne's wound and wanted to retrieve ointment. For her, Ariadne stopped her and questioned why Sancha hadn't told the truth, as Ariadne alone was responsible for the situation. Sancha replied that she hadn't spoken the truth because Ariadne had saved her. She vowed to repay Ariadne with kindness and remain by her side until the end. Ariadne couldn't help but shed tears upon hearing Sancha's words. In her previous life, Ariadne had no one. She was shunned by her family and abandoned by her love. Ariadne had never experienced such loyalty pledged to her, initially intending to use Sancha as a mere pawn. Ariadne now saw an act of loyalty undeserving of betrayal. Ariadne embraced Sancha and promised to protect her until her last breath. She vowed to hold Maletta accountable for her wrongful actions. Ariadne declared that no one would dare threaten them again. Sancha held Ariadne tightly, offering consolation. Both found solace in each other's arms. Several days passed, with Sancha attending to the clothes while Ariadne remained fixated on her recent experiences. She continually touched her ring finger, recalling the throbbing red dot and twitching finger. Ariadne's curiosity about the voice she heard persisted. Sancha warned her not to touch the wound, as it would only worsen. Ariadne then asked if it appeared to be growing. Sancha responded that fingers don't grow overnight. Ariadne remarked that Sancha had changed and was no longer the adorable stray kitten she had found on the side of the street. Sancha's sharp tongue had also emerged. Sancha brushed off Ariadne's comment and informed her that she had Gallica lessons to attend, as her tutor would arrive soon. Ariadne, having forgotten, told Sancha they would meet later before departing. While walking down the hallway, Ariadne could only think of the time she would spend with Sancha after her lesson. Suddenly, she overheard her stepmother conversing with the cardinal about sending Ariadne away. Ariadne's warm expression turned cold in an instant. Initially, Lucrezia had wanted Ariadne to live at the manor, but her stubbornness had become unbearable. Now, Lucrezia wished for Ariadne to leave as soon as possible, as they planned to marry her off to her former lover, Count Cesare. The only reason Cardinal de Mare refuses to marry Isabella to Cesare is because Isabella is far too valuable. She is too precious to be wed to someone like Cesare. For the Cardinal, Isabella is his most treasured possession until the day he decides to sell her off. 
He educates, grooms, and cherishes her so that his investment will yield wealth and status. The cardinal prefers Prince Alfonso to marry Isabella because he is the kingdom's sole heir. Ariadne is devising a plan that involves offering greater value to the prince than Isabella does. If her plan fails, she ensures that Isabella becomes worthless to the prince. Ariadne enters the room where the Gallica lessons are being held. Before entering, she stops in front of the door and smirks. Their instructor, Madame Romani, announces that they will end the lesson early as they have been invited to a special state mass. Ariadne greets Madame Romani in Gallica, surprising not only the instructor, but also Arabella and Isabella. Madame Romani compliments Ariadne on her fluent Gallica. Ariadne humbly thanks the instructor and tells her that she grew up with a Gallican, which greatly aided her progress when Madame Romani began teaching her. Madame Romani tells Ariadne that her manners are as good as her flawless Gallica and sees talent in her. Arabella complains about Arian's fluency in Gallica and accuses her of cheating. Ariadne covers her mouth and lectures Arabella, explaining that it is rude to raise her voice in the presence of their instructor. Madame Romani then asks if Ariadne has debuted yet, as she observes that Ariadne is now fit to be presented to society if she wishes. Isabella, with a darkened expression, is mad at Ariadne for stealing the limelight from her. However, she composes herself and plans to mesmerize all the people of San Carlo. Her plan consists of tightening her corset, ensuring the cross hangs chastely over her exposed bosom. She will be using the finest pearl powder from Hini for her foundation, and her cheeks and lips will glow with lavish rose water from Gita. The kingdom of Estruscan is a theocracy where the sovereign rule derives from a God-given divine right. Scripture states that virtuous souls are reincarnated as nobles and royals, while those who have sinned are reborn as peasants or worse. Therefore, the venerable souls of the aristocracy are duty-bound to guide and rule over the lowly souls of peasants. It is a nation under God, where the church grants legitimacy to the monarch. This is why the church ultimately reigns supreme in Etruscan. In this God-fearing nation, there is one occasion, celebrated with great importance. Once a month, the kingdom's populace gathers, from the king to the lowest peasant, to hear the cardinal deliver the words of God in what is known as a state. Mass, the cardinal and his family have arrived. Men are happy to catch even a glimpse of Isabella, while women envy the accessories she wears. They can only wish to have the courage to speak to her at least once. Isabella smirks menacingly, pleased that all the attention is focused on her. As she walks, elegantly, people start talking about the person behind her as no one recognizes her. Isabella turns and snickers at Ariadne who is wearing minimal makeup, has her hair tied in a messy bun, and is wearing a simple dress and a tacky silver cross around her neck. Ariadne doesn't care about her appearance in front of everyone. She knows that no matter how hard Isabella tries to flaunt her worth, no one will remember her after today's event. Ariadne assumes that if she is truly reliving her past, a deeply sacrilegious scandal will unfold. During today's event, shaking the nation to its core, this event will lead to her betrothal to her former lover, Cesar. Due to an incident, Cardinal de Mare was saved by the Etruscan king, Leo III. In return, for his help, the king made one proposal. He wished for the cardinal to become an ally to his powerless bastard son, Cesar. The illegitimate son of King Leo III was betrothed to the cardinal's daughter, Ariadne, who was considered worthless. Ariadne plans to change her past, but if she fails, she will end up marrying Cesar again. She hopes that the secret will unfold exactly as it did in her previous life. Cesare observes the cardinal's family, especially Isabella, believing that she is a fitting prize for him. Cesare de Camo is the most eligible bachelor in all of San Carlo, whether it be precious gems, the finest stallions, or the fairest debutantes in the land. All of it is firmly within Cesare's grasp. Above all, he is the son of the king and his most cherished mistress, Countess Rubina. He is revered and admired by all of Etruscan. Cesar claims Isabella is the only person fitting to be his wife. He plans to present his marriage proposal to Cardinal de Mare. He also plans to inform his father when he sees him the following month. Cesar then hears laughter above and sees both his father and Alfonso laughing with each other. This puts an angered look on Cesar's face. Unfortunately, Cesar can only be treated by the king is his son in private chambers, away from prying eyes. Cesar turns his back against them and notices Ariadne. He then asks her mother if she knows anything about her. Her mother tells him about Ariadne and how she has already impressed the queen. Surprised that Ariadne was able to gain the queen's attention, Cesar asks what she 
did to achieve that. Rubina lectures him not to judge a book by its cover. Since Ariadne was able to win the favor of the queen at a young age, despite being inexperienced, there may be more to her than meets the eye. Their conversation continues but stops when Cesare notices that the sermon is about to begin. Looking down, he sees the famed Apostle of Acerto. The Apostle of Acerto is a clergyman with a fervent following among the poor and downtrodden. Unlike the traditional interpretation of the Holy Scriptures, which contends that those who sinned in their previous life are reborn as lowly peasants in the next, the Apostle teaches the people that even the lowliest of the peons can learn and practice the sacred teachings of God and one day reach salvation as faithful children of the Lord. He claims that even peasants can elevate themselves in the eyes of the Most High. The Apostle of Acerto begins his sermon and surprises the people, especially the Cardinal. People are talking about how the Apostle's sermons are blasphemous. The Cardinal realizes that the Apostle is a heretic and aims to undermine their nation's very foundation. He cannot believe that he allowed the Apostle to preach at his Mass, knowing that the Apostle's sermon would result in his own persecution as a heretic. The Cardinal wants to stop the Apostle, but he was personally invited by the Pope himself. If he stops the Apostle, it would be a direct insult to the Pope. The Cardinal is now in a panic about what to do in this situation. When the Apostle proclaims that Saint Gon of Jersesh was once a child of man just like the rest of them, Ariadne intervenes and calls out the Apostle for his blasphemous sermon. They both debate in front of the people about their beliefs and which they should believe more. The Apostle or the scriptures they have lived by all their lives. The guard then asks the king if they should escort the cause of the commotion. The king asks if the guard is referring to the girl, to which the guard responds affirmatively. The king smirks, believing that the Apostle should be the one being dragged out instead of Ariadne. He then asks for her name, and Alfonso answers, telling the king that she is his friend and one of the people he most admires. Ariadne grabbed the apostle's collar and asked if he dared to question the holy scriptures. The cardinal was surprised by Ariadne's actions and planned to regain control of the situation before. It was too late. The doors of the church were opened, and the inquisition entered, asking for the heretic, criminal, priest Alejandro. The people of San Carlo were conversing with each other about the current event. The cardinal was surprised by the visit of the Inquisition and, in a panic, ran to explain the situation. The apostle of Acerto, priest Alejandro, had been charged with misleading the good people of Etruscan and was sentenced to be excommunicated by the Inquisition. The Inquisitor then called out the cardinal for allowing priest Alejandro, a known heretic, to deliver a sermon in his chapel and demanded an explanation for his part in the blasphemous sermon. The cardinal's expression darkened. He felt betrayed and believed that the plan was devised by Pope Ludovico. The cardinal assumed that the pope had devised the plot to keep his influence in check. The fact that the inquisitor arrived as the representative of the pope meant that the pope's judgment was final and absolute. The cardinal wanted to explain that what happened was a mistake and that he was not the one who invited the apostle, but he was cut off by his daughter, Ariadne. Ariadne requested to speak with the Inquisitor. In Ariadne's previous life, both the Apostle's sermon and the arrival of the Inquisitor had occurred. This meant that what would happen next would be a gamble for her. The Inquisitor informed her that she had no right to interfere with the matters of the church. Ariadne responded by telling him that she was the Cardinal's second daughter and created a story that her father knew of Priest Alejandro's heresy and had prepared an arena in which Priest Alejandro could be refuted in public. The cardinal was surprised by what Ariadne confessed and told her to stop talking. The inquisitor did not believe a word Ariadne said and accused her of mocking their work. The inquisitor added that since the cardinal had invited the priest to speak and made a mockery of the entire mess by hiding behind his daughter, both the cardinal and Ariadne were accused of mocking the sanctity of the mass. Ariadne felt pressure from the inquisitor but knew that backing down now would mean her end. She then confessed that the cardinal had only agreed for the priest to speak because priest Alejandro was a guest of the pope and was sent to San Carlo on the pope's direct order. If the cardinal had refused the pope's request, it would have been an insult to his reputation. Ariadne noticed that her words were working and continued to inform the inquisitor of the cardinal's supposed plan. She told the inquisitor that the cardinal knew of priest Alejandro's heresy and had already prepared a theological dissection of the apostles' teachings. The cardinal could only follow Ariadna's story to survive the Inquisition. The Inquisitor now had doubts and was unsure of the truth. They overheard the people of San 
Carlo agreeing with the Cardinal and Ariadne as she defended the honor of the Holy Scriptures. The people complimented Ariadne on her bravery and thought that she was following in her father's footsteps, considering her a hero. The Inquisitor could no longer rebuke and wanted to excuse themselves from the place. The Cardinal wanted the Inquisitor to take accountability for their actions. Ariadne felt glad, knowing that this time she could be free from her betrothal to Cesare. In the king's audience chamber, the king was talking with his servant about how spirited Ariadne was. He even thought that it was like watching a play performed by her and the Pope. He wished to reward her for her clear-headed retorts and thought of the heart of the deep blue sea. The servant was surprised to hear that. The heart of the deep blue sea is a uniquely sized and strikingly radiant sapphire believed to have been originally brought to the realm of man by a pod of dolphins. It is a priceless treasure, coveted by collectors across the land and, in particular, the object of ardent fixation for Countess Rubina. The king knew of his mistress's fixation on the said jewelry, which is why if he granted it to the cardinal's second daughter, it would eventually return to him once Ariadne married into his household. The king now had plans to betroth her to his son, Cesare. The cardinal asked Ariadne how she gained knowledge of theology. He was surprised when Ariadne responded that she taught herself by reading his books to pass the time. The cardinal still had doubts because Ariadne displayed an insight that hardly befitted a self-taught. Fifteen-year-old, Ariadne knew that her father would doubt her answer. She then told him about what she had learned, particularly Wycliffe's reflections on the nature of the Holy Son and Pelagian's letters on the study of the Trinitas. She further explained her opinion on both books when asked if she had read them. Ariadne knew that they were obscure treatises at the moment, but they would become essential reads for all nobility in a few years' time. The cardinal then asked if she wanted to join him and the other priests for a scripture study in the Great Chapel. Surprised by the offer, Ariadne declined and told her father that she wished to study alone and not embarrass him. In reality, she didn't want to reveal all her secrets right away. As Ariadne was about to leave, the cardinal called her again and complimented her for what had happened at the state mass. Hearing the compliment from her father, Ariadne felt a warm feeling. At the palace, Cesare was binge drinking wine. Her mother, Countess Rubina, asked if he had heard the latest news about Ariadne. Ariadne was now the hero of San Carlo. Cesare didn't care about the news and continued drinking wine which annoyed his mother. Rubina lectured him on his duties, such as choosing a spouse who was virtuous and wise, just as he was, to ascend the throne one day. Cesare stopped and told his mother to wake up from her dreams, as he could clearly see that Alfonso would ascend, not him. Cesare screamed at his mother when she told him that his father's love for him knew no bounds. He asked if that was the truth, why he was condemned to the life of an unlanded noble, a king's son who was bestowed nothing but a measly countdom. Countess Rubina was enraged by what he said and threw a glass against the wall. She told him that he would be her king one day. Countess Rubina informed him that the king was planning to bestow the heart of the deep blue sea upon Ariadne. Cesare knew the reason why his mother coveted the object. She had once been foretold the future by a fortune teller that whoever possessed the heart of the deep blue sea would rise to the throne one day. Eventually, she became the king's woman and bore him a son. She then told Cesare that everything she did was only for him and asked him to bring the jewelry to her. A letter was sent, inviting Ariadne to visit the palace to receive a gift from the queen. Ariadne was told to behave herself and avoid trouble by her father. Ariadne was surprised when her father personally escorted her to the palace. Ariadne's sole intention was to avoid her betrothal to Cesare, but she received a reward from the queen instead. When Ariadne saw her reflection, she thought that her clothes may be a bit bland. She had an idea and immediately went to the garden. Ariadne was searching for peonies in the rear courtyard of the queen's palace. She was startled when she heard someone calling her name. When she was told to look up, she saw Alfonso sitting high up in the tree. Ariadne gets called into her father's chamber and he questioned her about her vast knowledge of theology to which Ariadne claims that she read the books of theology in his study to pass her time. The moment her father realizes that she had been self-teaching herself, he starts to think to himself how a mere 15 years old can display such knowledge without even having any proper training by some teacher and Ariadne feels like her father started doubting her as she thought that he would. Ariadne then goes forward to explain how she finished reflections on the true nature of the Holy Son and also letters on the study of the Trinitas to prove her claim, not only did she claim having the knowledge of vast theology, but she then elaborates on the whole thing to prove her claims. After hearing the explanation of Ariadne, 
her father turns around to let her know that he holds a scripture study with a number of priests in the great chapel and asks if she would like to join them in their study. But knowing that she cannot show her way so soon, she decides to act humble saying that she wouldn't dare to impose on their personal study. While claiming that there are many chances that she would end up embarrassing them, instead if it happened in the first place. When she claims that she would like to continue studying at home instead, her father advises her to leave his chamber, while Arienne continues to think about how it could have gone way worse for her. But before she is about to leave, her father calls her from behind and decides to praise her, while she bows down to him to show him respect. Meanwhile, Césaire's mother comes in asking him about his knowledge of Cardinal de Mer's second daughter, while he continues to gulp down wine while sitting exposed to sunlight. His mother explains how devout a believer she is, and not only that, but she also praises her for being the hero of San Carlo, as if she is following the good cardinal's footsteps which leaves the entire kingdom of Etruscan enamored with her. Instead of focusing on his mother's words, Caesar continues to pour more and more wine to chug it down while his mother witnesses his idiotic act. She then raises his voice, calling him out for the fact that he has a duty to choose for himself a spouse who is highly virtuous and wise, while reminding him that he has a duty to ascend to the throne, one day when it comes. The whole situation makes Caesar act up against his mother claiming that she has to know that Alfonso has an iron grip over the throne already, which makes him quite the useless one in front of them. Even so, his mother isn't ready to hear any kind of excuse, claiming that his father truly loves him quite well which he doesn't even know about. As soon as Caesar hears his father's name out of her mouth, he starts to react demanding to know from her why he decided to condemn him to the life of an unlanded noble to rot, within concealed palace walls while clenching his fist. His mother then gets even angrier, as he decides to raise his voice against her, so she throws the wine glass on the wall to let him know his place. Then she grabs onto his collar saying that he will surely be the king, no matter what happens in the future. She then informs him that the majesty already planned to bestow the heart of the deep blue sea upon the girl, and reminds him why she had been coveting the stones all these years as Caesar had been once foretold by the fortune teller, that the one who possesses. The heart of the deep blue sea will rise to the throne one day which inspired her to collect the stones all these years. That is the main reason she had to become the king's woman and even delivered him a son while following the fortune told by the fortune teller and making him realize that she is only doing all these things for him. She then asks Caesar to bring her the heart of the deep blue sea to make everything happen as it is said according to the fortune teller's words. At the same time, Ariadne is seen with her father who then asks her to keep herself out of any kind of trouble as they get out of the carriage together. Ariadne couldn't believe that her father would escort her to the king's palace as the queen herself had invited her on majesty's behalf to grant her a reward for her sake. Even though she had been trying to avoid her betrothal to Caesar, but the matter is now getting out of her control. Then when she starts to head into the palace's courtyard looking for peonies as she remembers from her past life, she gets called out by someone and it seems that the person is none other than Alfonso who is yelling her name while sitting on the branch of a tree nearby. Alfonso then advises Ariadne to climb up the tree and Alfonso suddenly realizes that she had been wearing a gorgeous white dress which would probably get ruined in gasps. At that moment, Alfonso then asks Ariadne if she could climb up on his lap which starts to feel too forward for Ariadne despite the fact that he is a prince. But as she reminisces the fact that she had been ruined and betrayed by Caesar in her previous life, she decides to listen to him as he is her only way to escape from Caesar's death claws as if he is the only golden ticket she has. She then ends up listening to Alfonso's request and it seems that Alfonso was trying to keep her dress clean all this time while she was wondering about something else. Then Alfonso asks Ariadne about her reason to visit the palace all of a sudden and Ariadne claims that she has a schedule for an audience with the queen which makes. Alfonso remember the special day while adding that his father speaks the world of her with high grace. It seems that the king was feeling down for the reason that he couldn't grant her a knighthood and Ariadne remarks that she is sad about that as well since her wish was to become a knight in shining armor from the beginning. As they continue to talk, Alfonso states that he will turn her into a knight himself. Some day which makes Ariadne chuckle on her own for the fact that she will be swearing an oath of allegiance to him soon enough. Instead of waiting for that moment someday, Ariadne starts swearing upon the sanctity of her soul to pledge her everlasting loyalty to Alfonso from that moment on. She promises that it will be an honor for her to protect him in any moment of hardship 
or strife as she will be placing the well-being of the prince above her own life. After hearing the magical and enchanted words out of Ariadne's mouth, Alfonso starts to feel the butterflies inside his stomach as he praises her for her determination. He thinks that with bright and loyal people like her by his side, he might become a half-decent king after all, in the end while keeping his humble picture in front of her. After seeing the humble face of Alfonso, Ariadne starts to regret as she lured Alfonso into a trap and made him die a dog's death, which still makes her ashamed that she is now swearing an oath to protect his life. She still continues to wonder what will happen if he somehow gets to know what she had done to him in the past as she clenches her dress, reminiscing what will happen in the future as there is chance that Alfonso might start to hate her if he ever gets to know about it. As she continues to wonder about all these things, she suddenly slips from the tree branch. But before she is about to fall on the ground, Alfonso ends up catching her in the air as he is concerned about her well-being. Ariadne then thanks him for his grace while smiling, and Alfonso suggests that she should be more cautious about herself as Ariadne starts to feel giddy about the whole thing as if her heart starts to feel the bliss of his love. Then Alfonso asks Ariadne what she was doing in the garden before he found her as he knows that it isn't the way of his mother's audience chamber. Ariadne then clears up the incident by saying that she was looking for a flower to decorate her hair as she was worried that her outfit was feeling a little drat which makes Alfonso say that he finds it rather striking instead. When Ariadne starts to feel rather surprised, she claims that it would have been better for her to wear some jewelry to add some glamour as she must be the only lady to seek an audience with the queen in such a sorry state because of her achievements. While she continues to think about her intentions, Alfonso notices what is truly weighing on Ariadne's mind, so he then makes her wear a locket of the cross on her neck while her whole hair is messy. When Ariadne notices his feeling about the situation as he had used his decoration and tied her hair himself, she starts to chuckle on her own as she had never seen this version of Alfonso who is quite unembellished and innocent. Ariadne then appreciates his gracious thoughts and kindness before heading into the queen's audience to accept the reward she was supposed to get from her. The moment comes as Ariadne is about to accept the reward from the queen. The queen remarks saying that she never thought that the kind would ever reward her with something like that. When Ariane wonders what she is about to be given by the king, because of her work, the queen reveals that she is about to be given the heart of the deep blue sea and Ariane plops down on the ground yelling that she cannot accept this sort of reward from her. After seeing her reaction, the whole audience keeps looking at her straight wondering why she wouldn't accept this sort of thing even though it is an honor for her family which is supposed to be treasured. But only Ariadne knows what problem she is about to face. After having the precious stone to herself, while it might be quite a treasure for someone, else as she already has the experience of her previous life. She knows that everyone who wants to stone themselves will be out for Ariadne to stab her in the back. When the queen sees Ariadne's reaction, she claims that she understands her situation, but she doesn't know what to do otherwise as the king has ordered it to happen himself, so the family heirloom is about to go to her. Before handing the jewel to Ariadne, the queen states that knowing that she doesn't have the power to protect the jewel herself, it will be better to make all those who are obsessed with the jewel come to a standoff, which typically means that she would have them keep each other in check. When Ariadne realizes that she will have to take the jewel herself anyways, she decides to act proud and brave about it. Then when she asks for a favor from the queen, she lashes out at Ariadne as if she had said something shameless in front of the whole audience. But then when the situation calms down, the queen chuckles in the most ecstatic way as Ariadne keeps on sweating on her own as the queen decided to hear out her thoughts. It seems that the queen has been fixated on her mind to give some kind of gift on her behalf. When the queen continues to praise Ariadne, the maids continue to speak of Ariadne as if she is the younger reflection of the queen herself as she is almost as witty and demure as she were. But while remembering her younger days of becoming a queen, the queen hopes that Ariadne will have easier days than her as fate didn't treat her so mindlessly. When Ariadne leaves with all the pieces of jewelry given by the queen to meet her sister, she is quite ecstatic to see them all while she continues to check up on the amethyst earrings. She then continues to brag how the earrings color matches her eyes which her mother starts to agree with by saying that the earrings feel like they were made only for her. Isabella then starts grabbing onto Ariadne asking if she can keep the earrings while claiming that these are looking quite stunning on her, which makes Ariadne's mind go blank. To butter up the whole situation even more, Isabella's mother then asks Ariadne to leave the earring for her, while remarking that it is better for someone to share the joy, rather than keeping it all for herself. 
At the same time, she claims that she will be holding on to the 50 Ducato on her behalf until she has any need of it as it is quite heavy for her to handle for now. Then Ariane remarks that she would love to share all the pieces of jewelry with them, but she doesn't have the liberty to do so, which makes Isabella directly call her greedy, without even thinking twice about the situation. Then Ariadne claims that she didn't mean to act like a greedy person, but the queen gifted all this jewelry personally to her and had both of their initials engraved on all of these ornaments for betterment. Ariadne then reminds them how giving away a royal gift of this sort without permission can turn into a punishable insult against the royal household which surprised the mother and Isabella both at the same time since they weren't expecting it to happen all of a sudden. To create the situation even mesmerizing, Ariadne takes out the acknowledgement paper of the receipt of 50 Ducato in gold, which is done on behalf of Rambouillet's shelter of the Queen Margaret. She expresses that the entire sum has already been donated in her name, which makes the mother react so much that she starts to shake Ariadne continuously in anger, as if she had committed some grave sin. She couldn't hold the fact that Ariadne decided to cast away all the money while Ariadne claims that it was a small price to pay for their family's good name since the queen herself commended the Demer family for their service to those less fortunate than them. After hearing out the whole story, Lucrezia goes on to raise her hand against Ariadne but, before she is about to do so, her husband calls out to her from behind claiming that he isn't surprised even a bit after seeing her harsh behavior. He then reminds her how many prying eyes are now scrutinizing their household so he advises her not to let the greed blind her so she could stop humiliating herself even further down the road. Ariadne's father then remarks on the fact that she had been granted the heart of the deep blue sea and claims that he is interested in taking a look at it. As soon as he lays his eyes on the stone, he recalls the fact why it is called the most precious jewel in the entire kingdom and offers her to keep it in his study since she doesn't have a safe on her own. The moment her father offers her help, Ariadne starts to stutter in speaking while wondering why the thing that she was waiting for was taking so much time. Then suddenly, someone knocks on their door, and it seems that some people from the royal palace came to deliver the royal order of Queen Margaret as she wanted Ariadne to have a self-dedicated storage to keep the precious jewel. But when the people wanted to know which room they had to select, Ariadne goes on to talk about her room in the attic on the third floor, but her father interrupts her by saying, that it will be in the westernmost room on the second floor which belongs to his elder son, Ippolito which gets the couple into a shocking argument which feels like just the perfect moment to Ariadne as she continues to smirk on her own. It seems that Ariadne has gotten a new way to have a new room for her, so she decides to leave for her new room, and it seems that the bedroom has a study included with it as a privilege of being a cardinal's eldest son. It seems that the whole planning was done by Ariadne previously when she decided to have a conversation with the queen privately, and it even worked out gracefully in the end. But Ariadne couldn't think that the queen was about to accept the offer at any cost and would even serve her with various precious jewelry at the same time. Also, none of them would be given to Isabella knowing the current situation. Soon, a maid comes in to let her know that there was another messenger from the palace as he had left something for her in a gift box. Then as soon as she releases the clip from the box, she notices a precious amethyst hair clip along with a note for her which has the letter A written on it which starts to make her smile on her own. The next day when the special maid of Ariadne, Sancha is about to prepare the bed for her, Ariadne claims that she doesn't have to do that herself, but Sancha makes it clear that the new maids will have to prove themselves before having the authority to take care of her as they aren't worthy of touching her at all. While they are talking to each other, Arabella comes into the room holding on to her musical instrument claiming that she isn't in her room to play but she is present in the room to keep an eye on Ariadne to make sure that she isn't up to some funny business. Ariadne realizes that Arabella is quite bored, but it is only normal for her since no one truly has the time for her as the cardinal only thinks about his elder children while having no time for the youngest one, Arabella who is always seen as a nuisance with no apparent value at all. Ariadne then thinks that she should be there for Arabella as she has none beside her, so she starts asking about the lute in her hands. When Ariadne questions Arabella if she likes to play or not, Arabella claims that she doesn't know anything about her at all as she is nothing but the prodigy of the lute with a big smile on her face. When Ariadne acts surprised after being exposed to such new information, Arabella explains that she is quite the composer as well as she starts to release the musical talent in front of her. When the maid and Ariadne listen to the originally composed music by Arabella, both of them are quite impressed by her skills, 
but Arabella starts to act shyly trying to act humble in front of their praise. Ariadne then remarks that she has quite a talent when it comes to musical instruments, so she should be requesting her parents to buy her a different instrument to play with while claiming that a pipe organ might be better for her instead. After hearing the advice of Ariadne, Arabella reveals that she is quite interested in a pipe organ since she wants to arrange the piece to play at mass, but their mother restricted her saying that it is quite expensive to buy since she isn't her beloved Isabella. Then Ariadne shits onto her suggestion and suggests that she should be persuading Isabella to ask for one knowing that the mother would surely approve if the request were coming directly from Isabella. When Ariadne looks at Arabella's face, she realizes that Arabella herself knows for a fact that her parents surely love Isabella more than her, and it makes her think why she would feel pity for a child who has everything that she never had in the first place. Arabella starts acting on her instincts, so she asks out Isabella for a pipe organ, as was suggested by Ariadne previously. But Isabella directly claims that it isn't some toy to amuse herself with as such extravagance is a sin that reflects poorly on a lady of good standing. Then Arabella starts to act rough to act on her feelings, claiming that she is about to use them for her music, while Ariadne remarks how Isabella's expensive foreign maid, makeup and trinkets aren't a matter of extravagance to anyone. But at the same time, Ariadne knows that it is entirely in character for someone like Isabella to be a brazen hypocrite, so she decides to express how beautiful of a music that Arabella could compose on her own to ease out the situation for the little sister. Not only that but also, Ariadne then asks Arabella if she could play for them, to which Arabella agrees easily and starts playing so gracefully that Isabella ends up being shocked after listening to her music in the end. Isabella seems quite interested in her music and Arabella thought of creating the hymn to be played at a mass, even though she hadn't finished it. As soon as Isabella ends up finishing the appraisal part, she asks, Arabella if they can have a sisterly chat alone which ends up uprooting Ariadne from her place in the room. When Ariadne leaves the room, she starts talking about being a worthy member of the family while patting her head insisting that their glory is surely shared between siblings. Soon the whole kingdom of people starts talking about the Demers young lady playing, a hymn that she wrote herself for the mass which makes everyone wonder how talented the sisters are which makes them quite the combination. But it seems that instead of Arabella being promoted for the music, it is Isabella who is about to steal the spotlight out of her sister's name claiming herself to be a god-gifted musician. Soon after, Camellia comes in to visit the premise with her partner Otavio, since she was invited by Isabella herself since she is a renowned connoisseur of music. Otavio seems rather excited after seeing Isabella as he starts to blush after meeting her, which makes Camellia quite jealous of the situation. When the couple leaves in front of her sight, Isabella promises herself that she isn't going to let Ariadne steal the limelight ever again as she is about to take away all the glory from her, while Arabella continues to seat down inside the crowd keeping her head down as she is hopeless as always. Back in the past, Arabella was quite amazed to get her new instrument as she could then start playing as much as possible as she wanted to rearrange her piece for the mast, but at the same time, she couldn't help but wonder why Isabella would always get whatever she wants and any time she wants, while she has always said that she isn't good enough despite being her sole sister. At that time, Ariadne came up to Arabella confirming her suspicions that Isabella asked something from her in exchange as she had managed to get Arabella the instrument that she wanted. It seems that Arabella had to agree to let her announce her hymn under Isabella's name in exchange for having a pipe organ. When Ariadne asks Arabella if she is feeling good after getting what she wanted, it seems that Arabella doesn't know what to say about it while she fails to understand why Isabella would only help her if she got to play her song in her name. Arabella asks Ariadne to be sure if Isabella is truly wrong or not. Ariadne claims that people don't do the right thing always which makes her question why that wouldn't work out since Isabella is her full-blooded sister in the first place. Arabella then starts to react saying that Isabella might be mean to Ariadne sometimes, but she wouldn't be doing that to her to which Ariadne decides to question Arabella why she was never allowed to have a pipe organ until Isabella suddenly asked for one. She also questions their parents asking why they wouldn't be interested in the matter knowing that Isabella doesn't have any kind of interest in musical instruments. When Arabella ends up hearing Ariadne out, Ariadne claims that staying silent and refusing to make a fuss only going to make the situation more problematic for her as no one would be able to know that she was wronged by her own sister. But instead of hearing Ariadne out, 
Arabella lashes out at Ariadne, claiming that she is only blabbering nonsense as if her sole intention was to insult Isabella. Arabella doesn't just stay within the limits, but she even brings out the fact that Ariadne isn't a true demer while believing that she is nothing but a fraud as she continues to tear up. As Ariadne notices Arabella in such a broken state, Ariadne reminisces about being like her once in her life as she was in denial just like her as truth only continues to break, people in the end. But at the same time, she knows that she cannot be the one to save Arabella and thinks that she had already done what she could do for her. Then in the present time, Isabella is about to begin the ceremony in front of a huge crowd, and they are quite ecstatic to see her perform directly. But soon their face changes, as soon as the music changes into something rather uncanny which even makes Arabella gasp in fear, as she wasn't expecting something like that to happen. The musician beside her presenting the whole hymn calls an end to the musical and claims that they have to end the rest at all because of obvious reasons but at the same time, he hopes that she was able to satisfy her curiosity. He points out that there is some unusual part in the middle of the melody that they are working on and when he realizes that she decided to make a bold choice by putting an extra emphasis on that part, he asks Isabella to demonstrate that part for the whole crowd. Arabella realizes that Isabella is now in a tough situation as she doesn't know how to read. Musical sheets on her own, but instead of backing down, Isabella starts to blame it all on the musicians for calling themselves professional as they are having a tough time, changing the scales. At that moment, Arabella thinks of having her sister's back so she calls out in their direction hoping to calm the situation down claiming that the version of the score must be missing the string instruments as the change in scale wasn't intentional at all. She then starts to correct the chords as it would be impossible for someone to play by hand to complete a segment missing from the part. But before Arabella was about to change the wave of situation, people already started to whisper among themselves, even the professional musicians hired in the ceremony. They have already realized what truly happened in the background as nobody ever spoke about, Isabella de Mare having any kind of talent for music in the first place. Even Camellia starts to laugh at the situation as Isabella was trying to steal her own sister's work to put herself in the spotlight. Then to recover from the situation, their mother comes in front of the crowd to fix the misunderstanding by saying that the whole thing was composed by the two sisters in collaboration. She insists that Isabella came up with the overall motifs in the musical, while Arabella took care of the details so it would typically illustrate her as the main composer in this situation. But at that moment, someone inside the crowd starts questioning the woman for claiming something like that, and it seems that the man is none other than Count Caesar himself. People continue to cheer after meeting their eyes with Caesar, and it seems that Caesar is loving it to be under the spotlight at the same time. Caesar then grabs Isabella's hand to kiss it with her wholehearted content while expressing her beauty. But it seems that Caesar had some other intention than only speaking about her fairness. As a rose, he brings up the topic of Isabella having no flavors as she is trying to grasp someone else's talent while carrying a heavy load of envy in her. Isabella then starts to react in that instant by claiming that there is no way she would ever be envious of someone so beneath her, which makes him feel like he is already successful in his mission, as he didn't even need to mention any kind of name in front of her. He then goes forward with matching her intellect with her looks by mockingly calling it whole as something impressive and even calls out the crowd of people to comment on her intellect which makes them start to snicker at the same time. When Isabella tries to confront Caesar about his reaction, he starts to elaborate on how he came in to listen to the hymn. But he had to get entertained by something else altogether. Then after bidding his farewell, Caesar decides to take his leave with his men as they continue to snicker and glance at Isabella while they are about to leave while Lucrezia and her two daughters continue to stand in the middle of the ground. Even the maids looking at Isabella start to make her feel a burning sensation in her, and at the same time, Caesar's companion, Atavio, Isabella's own brother, asks Caesar why he had taken the instance of having such a sharp tongue this dramatic day to lighten up his mood. When Caesar doesn't follow through with his question, Ottavio claims that he thought that Caesar had taken quite a liking toward young Isabella, but even though it is a truth, she has nothing except for having a beautiful face. But Ottavio tries to calm Caesar by claiming that he might be trying to win Isabella back, by acting rough while jabbing Caesar on his hand as if he is trying to act friendlier with him. But Caesar's remark gets the simple guy Ottavio quite in a tough situation, and Caesar claims that he would love to get a drink on the way to lighten up the heady mood. 
Caesar then decides to ride alone on the horse and suggests Ottavio join him at the salon, which makes Ottavio wonder what kind of tarrant the man must be to act like that. On the other hand, Isabella is having a hard time getting out of her foul condition, knowing that she has no way to get herself in front of the public from now on as even Count Caesar looked at her with sheer contempt in his eyes. She thinks that people are about to outcast her from high society, and as soon as Lucrezia notices Arabella beside her she starts, yelling at her for not keeping her mouth shut in front of the crowd. When Arabella elaborates, she was only trying to help and at the same time, she wanted the piece to be played with the right score, she continues to yell at her that it doesn't matter to her since her sister's reputation is now in tatters. Isabella then joins the bandwagon to claim that it is Arabella's fault that the people are now shaming her for no reason while pointing out that it was her song. As soon as Arabella hears the word uttered from Isabella's mouth, Arabella starts to yell at her by correcting that it is her own song since she was the one who wrote it herself, pointing out the fact that Isabella is the one who stole her song in the first place. Arabella then begs her mother to believe the fact that she wrote the song herself, but it seems that Lucrezia is only about hearing Isabella while not caring about whatever happens to her youngest daughter. When Arabella looks up at her mother, she glares at Arabella with anger claiming that her sister is the crowning jewel of high society and their family's pride and joy. She also repeats that she will not be allowing Arabella or someone other than her to stand in Isabella's way so she should continue to keep her voice to herself. Lucrezia doesn't just stop there, but she is also ready to beat the senses into her youngest sister for the sake of Isabella, so she continues to beat Arabella until she apologizes to her sister. When the beatdown finally finishes, the maids continue to glance and whisper at the sight of the youngest daughter, while Arabella stops in front of Ariadne as she is ready to embrace her even in her worst state. Arabella then proudly accepts the embrace of the sister who isn't even related to her through blood and starts releasing up all the pent-up tears inside her. As days pass, Ariadne is invited to the salon by Alejandro de Chibout for the art. Exhibition on the Friday of August as even Prince Alfonso is about to be present there to check out the exhibition. While Ariadne continues to read through the mail sent to her, Isabella asks her maid, Melita, to check out if there were no other invitations in the mail for her desperately. But the maid answers her in negative kindly. After sensing that there is no other way, Isabella asks Ariadne if she is about to attend Marchioness de Chibout's salon while implying that it wouldn't be wise for her to join the exhibition since Ariadne didn't have her debut. Yet as she wouldn't be allowed to attend it without a chaperone which makes Ariadne realize that Isabella isn't wrong for this time. Then when Isabella gets excited about joining the salon on that day, their father makes an announcement saying that it is the right time for it Ariadne have her own debutante ball, which gets everyone including Isabella and her mother quite surprised as they weren't expecting to hear something like that. Isabella remarks that the season has already ended, so it will not be possible to make it happen. But it seems that there is a system for someone to have the debutante ball if they are quite special compared to the others, belonging to the high-ranking members of the aristocracy. Isabella wasn't expecting something to happen, so she ends up slamming on the dinner table, but it seems that the cardinal is quite true to his words as it seems that he is about to make it happen since Ariadne is representing the Demir household. As soon as Isabella hears the whole thing, she thinks that she somehow has to stop Ariadne from attending the exhibition as it wouldn't be ready until autumn at the earliest. Isabella even kicks her mother's feet to speak up about it so Madame Lucrezia starts acting to back up her daughter claiming that she will soon be needed to have a physician check on her. While the cardinal worries about his wife's situation, Ariadne claims that she doesn't want the mother to have such pain for her for no reason. At that time, Isabella was quite sure that Ariadne would not be able to join the exhibition at all at the salon, but it seems that Ariane already had some other plans in her grasp. Then on the day of joining the salon for the exhibition, her maid Sancha is quite excited to know that Prince Alfonso will also be present in the crowd to attend the salon. Knowing that Sancha falls into a great dilemma wondering if Ariane should have gone for something a bit more flashier than usual which makes Ariadne feel rather uncanny as she is already glad to attend the salon. It seems that Ariadne had asked Madame Romani to attend the salon as her chaperone and she gladly accepted her proposal with a big smile on her face. It seems that not only meeting Alfonso is her only target since Ariadne is quite excited to purchase some paintings as she already knows the future. She thinks of buying good paintings as they will continue to soar in price if the painters become master painters in the employ of the Holy See hoping that it would be a great investment for her. 
but at the same time she is quite excited to meet Victoria Nike, which is a statue of the ancient goddess of victory that is proudly standing inside the salon reflecting its sheer beauty and intact preservation lending its value beyond compare. It seems that the statue was already beyond repair when it was noted in the journal and the noble who bought the Victoria Nike statue to keep it in front of their courtyard was indeed fake. Knowing that the drama is about to unfold in front of her, she starts to get excited about the fact that she is about to see the most entertaining moment of her life soon. As soon as Ariadne reaches the salon, she gets called into a place which makes everyone inside the place murmur about her as people keep comparing her looks with Madame, Lucrezia and Isabella at the same time. But it seems that Ariadne is already used to some situations like that since it didn't change that much from her previous life. When she is about to move away from the crowd, she notices that people have surrounded Prince, Alfonso to have the touch of his grace while he is brightening up the whole place. Instead of caring about the whole thing, Ariadne prepares to leave for the garden until the auction begins knowing that people will ignore her anyways as she doesn't want Alfonso to see her, thinking that people are always truthful about her looks. But before she is about to move away, Alfonso notices her and calls out to her despite the fact that he was surrounded by a huge crowd of nobles. After moving away from the crowd, Alfonso meets Ariadne eye to eye to finally greet her face to face after a long time which brings a big smile to her face as it brightens up her mood in an instant. As soon as both of them meet their eyes, they greet each other in a friendly manner as they are both happy to see each other. Ariadne then comments on how Alfonso had to struggle quite a lot to get out from the crowd into which he thinks that it was nothing for him as he thinks that Ariadne is a more important of matter to him. Alfonso then expresses his exclamation as he never thought that he will be meeting Ariadne in the salon, so he asks her and curious to know who her chaperone really is. When Alfonso thinks that it is probably her mother Madame Lucrezia, Ariadne elaborates that it isn't her mother, but she is being chaperoned by her tutor Madame Romani, which feels excellent to Alfonso that she is having great company with her. It seems that Ariadne is quite happy with her outfit this time, more than the previous one which makes him remark the topic about the hairpin he had sent to her through a messenger. After remembering about the hairpin, Ariane claims that she will make sure to wear it the next time as it wasn't matching with her dress this time in the event, but she couldn't manage to say that it is not really in her style to wear something like that, knowing that it will upset him quite so much. While Alfonso continues to talk about heat in skipping the fencing sessions, Ariadne leads him to some place to look at some flowers which gets Alfonso mesmerized by her beautiful looks along with the charming flowers blooming on the trees. As both of them enter the garden filled with flowers, Alfonso notices that no one would see them together, as all the shrubs are so tall and overgrown which will hide them from people's glances altogether. The moment the realization hits him even more strongly, he shuts his own mouth as he started to think about something else, rather romantic even though he says to himself that they are nothing more than friends to hide his red face. When Alfonso offers Ariadne a flower from one of the trees, Ariadne claims that the lady of the salon wouldn't be so unused about the situation after finding out. Alfonso insists that there are ways to hide the flowers under her skirt as Ariadne worries about throwing the flowers away before leaving the premise. While Ariadne continues to chuckle after hearing Alfonso out, he raises his hand to lift Ariadne so she can pick one of the flowers of her choice which leaves Ariadne in awe as she wasn't expecting something like that to happen to her. She ends up plucking one of the most blooming flowers and while Ariadne is focused on looking at the flower, Alfonso continues to glance at her as if she is far more precious than the flower itself. Soon when they wrap up plucking the flowers, the exhibition announcement starts on behalf of the Marquis and Marquinus de Chibout for their hospitality while carrying the name of Prince Alfonso de Carlo for his presence in front of the nobles. The man who is announcing the names of nobles introduces himself as Vincencio from the Republic of Porto, which makes Ariane realize that Victoria Nike was successful at gathering a huge crowd since she had never seen so many nobles in one place. Vincencio then begins the showdown with smaller pieces made by the finest painters, and as soon as the Virgin Mary of Narcissus is announced for the bidding, Ariadne raises her hand, knowing that because of the low popularity of the painter, nobody will be wanting to purchase it except for her. As she already knows that the value of the painter will surely go up in the future, she thinks of having the paintings in her grasp to benefit more in the future. But while she was laughing on her own thinking that none of them will be about to predict her plans, Someone beside her starts to bid on the paintings, 
and it seems that the person who is putting off dirt on her plans is none other than Count Césaire, the supposed villain of her life. When Ariane glances at Césaire, Césaire glances back at her, while having the same smug look on his face which indicates that he is trying the best in his ability to provoke her from the beginning as he is someone who will try his best to grasp onto something that is interested in someone to make them feel worthless, knowing what she has to do. Anyways, Ariadne raises her hand once again to bid on the painting once again to challenge Césaire and she ends up winning the bid in the end with the amount of 10 Ducato. She then contemplates how she now has to pay more price for the painting just because of Césaire, but she ended up meeting her end goal for the day since she will be able to sit, back and watch the whole auction unfold in peace. Soon Victoria Nike is presented in front of the crowd, so Ariane gets prepared to watch the drama unfold as she starts, biting on the cookies in front of her in excitement. All the nobles around the whole salon start to talk about the gorgeous statue in front of them as if they have never seen something so mesmerizing as that ever in their whole life, which has a soft shade of pink on its body. Then the anchor announces the starting bid at 1,200 Ducato, which makes Ariadne remember who was the person that won the bid in her previous life. But it seems that she can now hardly remember who the person was. As she is deep inside her thoughts, Alfonso calls out to the man claiming that he is about to start, the bidding which makes Ari and gasp as she didn't expect him to start bidding on the statue. Then at the same time, Count Marcello starts bidding on the statue in the amount of 1,300. Ducato which makes her think that she will be fine as Alfonso isn't about to bid back on the statue, but she was wrong. Alfonso continues to bid on the statue for 1,500 Ducato and it continues for countless times between Alfonso and Marcello and soon it reaches up to 2,000 on behalf of Alfonso. Ariadne realizes that she needs to do something about it since she cannot let Alfonso win the statue as she continues to whisper to herself. It seems that Caesar ends up listening to her whispers, and he ends up asking her about it. But without listening to any of her words, Count Caesar reveals to the public claiming that Ariadne is saying one would be a fool to purchase such a sculpture, which makes the whole crowd murmur among themselves and makes Ariadne think that Caesar must have lost all his senses. Then after hearing Caesar utter such a thing with his mouth, Vincencio starts reacting to it, asking it back to them as he couldn't wonder anyone to make such a claim at any cost. Then to shift the blame again to Ariadne, Caesar points his finger once again at Ariadne, as if it would be better to be asking her the question. But instead of pressing on the matter for Ariadne to handle, Caesar ends up demanding, the man about the ingenuity of the statue as if there are countless chances for it to be a counterfeit for some reason. As soon as he finishes his line, the crowd once again starts to murmur wondering how the famous statue of Victoria Nike can be a counterfeit. Then to recover the situation, Ariane ends up stating to Césaire that she didn't make any sort of claim like that, but he presses on the matter saying that she is the one who made such a claim which angers Ariane even more. Then to defuse the situation at that point, Vincencio ends up calling out to Ariadne from the crowd as she now has to explain the situation by herself, which makes her wonder what kind of sin she must have done to have such a fate on this day as well. Then Ariadne then starts to cry in front of the whole crowd acting like a little girl who doesn't know anything about statues and their ingenuity claiming that all of the nobles are now picking on someone like her even though she is some silly girl without any kind of serious knowledge about the statue but it is all inside Ariadne's brain since she couldn't help acting like that, and since she knows that she cannot let Alfonso such garbage which has no value to it as it can make him lose face in front of the whole kingdom if they hear that Alfonso spent that so much with 2,000 Ducato. Ariadne knows that she cannot stand Alfonso being a laughingstock, so she decides to step out of her seat to question Signor Vincencio as she knows that he is nothing less than a veteran auctioneer of antique art. She advises the man to take a careful look at the statue to check out the ingenuity himself as he is more knowledgeable about the statue. But the man instantly claims that the statue surely is genuine otherwise, he would have nothing to do with it with his full confidence. Ariadne then makes the man remember the quote pressed onto the statue as it has already been damaged, and it seems that he has quite the knowledge about it and believes that it was then repaired in the end. Vincencio then explains how the restoration doesn't equate to forgery as the process was done in the Hellenian era, and at that moment, Ariane asks Caesar to hand him over his club knowing that he surely carries one with him. Surprised, Caesar decides to hand Ariane over to his club while she goes on to prove her claims in front of Vincencio. 
She claims that hitting the statue once will prove everything as the statue will end up breaking down in one strike, but when Ariadne ends up striking the statue, everyone gasps as the carriage that was carrying the statue instantly falls down. But even when the statue drops on the ground, each and every part of the statue stays, unbroken as if it was made brand new once and was never broken ever since. The moment Ariadne declares her opinion, Vincencio rages and lashes out to her calling her behavior outrageous and claiming that she has lost her senses, but this time Ariadne doesn't back out from her claims. She starts to interrogate the man with the club in her grasp questioning him if it is the real. Victoria Nike, which makes everyone gossip about the claims as nothing once broken will be staying intact after striking and falling down. Then at the same time, Caesar comes up to the man asking if he is even the real Vincencio Delgado as he has assumed something, even more conspicuous in his whole story. It seems that the man has already started running when Caesar ends up making the mischievous claims while the other nobles continue to run toward him, knowing that he is about to escape from the place as everyone now knows that he is a fraud. While the guards are up to guard the door to escape, Ariadne strikes glances at Caesar, and at that moment, people continue to talk about how the Demer young Ness has made such an achievement at the age of 15 once again by revealing the art frauds as claiming that she is nothing less than the blessing from the gods since she seems to have the eye of truth. Meanwhile, Ariadne is asking for an explanation from Count Caesar as she doesn't appreciate being pushed into the limelight with no regard for her reputation. Then Caesar only claims that if the end is well, Everything will be well at the same time proving that he isn't wrong about any of his actions. Ariadne also starts to protest against his familiar tone with her despite the fact that she doesn't even think of having a conversation with him at all. The moment she introduces herself as the second daughter of the cardinal for this diocese, Caesar stops her to continue talking while poking the middle of her forehead, claiming that she is yet to have a formal debut, otherwise she is still considered a child so he isn't about to have a little girl answering back to him about the way he decides to address her. He even goes forward with his words while mocking her by saying that she is wearing a garish little yellow frock which is only used by children. After that when Ariane is about to answer back at him, Caesar claims that he already knew that the real Vincencio Delgado was found murdered before the auction started and Ariane is surprised to hear it from him as he didn't even think of protesting the situation and he only kept on dumping the whole matter into her lap for her to handle. He then states that it would have been a high-risking situation for him if he took a step as the king's bastard since he isn't allowed to use the crown's authority to handle the matter. Ariadne then remarks that nobody ever advised him to get involved for the instance and at that time, Caesar claims that he came all the way to see her again and claims that it wasn't for an idle chat because he has some important thing to discuss with her, but it is quite simple for the matter. He then proposes that he will be paying her a handsome amount for the heart of the deep blue sea, which changes the whole situation for Ariadne as darkness engulfs her whole face. As soon as Ariadne hears him, she starts to shout at him while Caesar claims that he has the most valuable diamonds in his collections by mentioning the name of Linville Swan, while insisting that he is thinking of trading with her. It seems that Caesar is also interested in throwing in 6,000 Ducato on top and after hearing the name of Linville Swan. Ariadne starts to react as she has once heard of the diamond which is usually given by lovers to claim their true love. The same item that Ariadne used to covet among Caesar's possessions, but her dream wasn't fulfilled in the end as she was betrayed by the person she loved. But she starts to fume in anger that she didn't even have to dedicate her best years, commit murder or stake her own life on his behalf, but yet Caesar is interested to give away such items to her of his own volition. Even after knowing that the Linville Swan is far more precious than what she has in her grasp right now, Ariadne decides to reject the idea suggested by Caesar by claiming that she cannot leave the fortune granted by the king and the queen just so she could trade it with another. When Caesar didn't understand the situation, Ariadne insists that the item was entrusted by the crown to her and none other, so she isn't about to think of it as a mere trinket to be bargained for while squeezing her hand in anger. From there, she even continues to claim that he doesn't have any kind of sense judging right and wrong as she hoped that he will have more discernment than what he has right now while praying for him, hoping that he will come to his senses someday. But as Ariadne is about to leave his sight, he instantly commands and grabs her hand forcefully while she continues to insist that he should let her go, but Caesar is fired up about the things that Ariadne said to him already. While Ariadne continues to command him to let her go, 
Alfonso comes in the middle to protect and respect her opinion about the situation that arose in front of him. As Césaire fails to listen to his command, Alfonso repeats himself once again which makes Césaire bite the corner of his lip while bowing in front of him. But even while bowing down at him, Alfonso notices that he still hasn't let go of Ariane's hand which makes him remark on the fact that they haven't met previously before. When Césaire acknowledges the manner of the matter, he decides to let go of Ariadne's hand to kneel down in front of Alfonso uttering his name as the Royal Highness while illustrating himself to be his servant of him extending a greeting toward the Royal Highness. Then instead of replying to Count Césaire, Alfonso starts chatting with Ariadne, claiming that the Marquis and the Marchioness de Chibaut are both waiting for her presence so he shouldn't be keeping them waiting for the fact that the matter is indeed important. Alfonso then offers Ariadne to head in with him as he was about to head in that way anyways and before heading in. Alfonso says to Césaire that it was quite a pleasure to make his acquaintance so he can be leaving soon enough. Then before leaving the location, Ariadne claims that the fake statue damaged the floor when it fell so Césaire should be the one to take care of the repair costs, which then starts to annoy Césaire so much that he starts cursing her name when Alfonso and Ariadne head into the salon while clenching his fist. While Ariadne and Alfonso both are alone, he states that he is quite impressed by the whole endeavor and asks her how she was able to know that the statue was not real from the beginning. Ariadne then claims that it was only an assumption, but she is now relieved that her suspicions ended up becoming reality. Alfonso claims that he is now relieved to know that he wasn't able to buy the thing only because of her wisdom as he has already learned a lesson from her. When Alfonso is interested to know why did she have to act on her instincts while she didn't even know about the matter entirely, Ariadne claims that she never wanted to see him embarrassed after purchasing the statue which makes both of them blush at the same time as they continue to have a hard time looking at each other while Alfonso keeps on wondering if Ariadne truly has a soft spot for him. She then goes on to ask Alfonso for a favor that he was able to save all of his 2,000 ducato and in exchange, Ariadne asks for a favor and she makes Alfonso promise that he will be granting a wish in return. When Alfonso asks what kind of wish she might have for him, Ariadne claims that she isn't entirely sure about it, but she will be letting him know when the perfect time comes which Alfonso agrees to with a big smile on his face. Then at that moment, Alfonso bids farewell to Ariadne saying that the people might have been looking for him and after waving her hand right at the prince, Ariadne continues to wonder when she will get to meet him once again. But her mood then soon changes when Alfonso calls out to her saying that he will be writing to her soon enough so she should be writing back to him as well, which brings quite a smile to her face. Then a few days later, Ariadne is called into her father's chamber, and it seems that her father is about to hand the matter to her of being in charge of organizing her own debutante ball. But at the same time, he claims that the budget for it will be 150 ducato, and she must be arranging the debutante ball with only the money which he is about to grant her, which makes Ariadne wonder what is happening because it is barely half of the usual budget for a ball. But Ariadne ends up agreeing to her father's proposition knowing that fortunately, she has previous life experiences in managing the royal palace's budget, so bookkeeping is naturally second nature for her by now. Soon a tea party is hosted by the daughter of Viscount Leonati, but even though Isabella is being taken care of by everyone present at the party, she seems rather uninterested feeling that the whole thing is quite tedious for her. When she wasn't taking any of the offered sweets to her, Letitia commands her people to bring the finest Gallican sweets that she has in the house. Then when Isabella glances at the butler, she realizes that the butler is quite handsome despite the fact that the nobles are less beautiful than him, as if the good looks are wasted on those of low birth. While she thinks of spending the time more interestingly, she notices that Camellia is staring at the butler named Domestico, while she is still sitting next to her fiancé. As Isabella calls out Camellia for the fact, Camellia starts to stutter while being nervous at the same time claiming that she doesn't know what she is trying to mean which surely angers her fiancé Octavio even more. To put more fuel into the fire, Isabella holds. Octavio's face claiming that he is quite beautiful himself insisting that he doesn't need to take any notice of the help. When the situation is about to get more intense, Ottavio calls out Isabella as Miss de Mare, but Isabella makes him hush by saying that he should be calling her out by her name instead while focusing on getting the matter deeper than it already is. When Ottavio agrees with the cunning Isabella, Camellia on the other hand starts to fume at rage, but cannot answer anything back to Isabella as she herself is quite caught in the moment. 
While Isabella continues to feel dreamy thinking that she is the most coveted woman in all of San Carlo, the maid comes in front of her announcing that Miss Julia de Baltazar has finally arrived to join the tea party and Julia is the daughter of Marquis de Baltazar. The moment Julia enters the room, the noble youngsters read her into the room to have a seat which starts to enrage Isabella as the focus has already shifted toward Julia instead of her. She continues to sit alone wondering what Julia has that she lacks as everyone is surrounding her as if she is some sort of goddess. She thinks that why would Julia have to be called out by the name while Isabella is only represented by her family name as if she is merely an accessory to that of her father as if she is already sick of bearing the Demir name. She thinks that once time and her father passes, she will belong to her brother instead of her, but she still has the option of basking in her own glory, which she deserves by turning into the crown princess. She thinks that is going to be the only way for her to own her name and she will be doing anything in her grasp to make it happen. On the other hand, Ariane is quite thoughtful of the situation about the ball she is about to attend and notices that all of her suspicions are correct, that she is left with only half of the amount people usually need to make the ball happen. Soon Madame Marini from Dressmaker Rajon enters the room to get her desired measurements while complimenting all her body features. When Marini tries to persuade her into having more revealing clothing, she realizes that she will have to change that as she has already faced trouble in her previous life as she doesn't want to have any slander on her name. But both Marini and the maid suggest otherwise as Marini claims that she will not be letting her down by swearing on her name and when Marini mentions the matter of her partner, Ariadne starts to dream about Alfonso. But instead of Alfonso, a man named Zenobi de Rossi approaches her to accompany her to the ball instead and the man even goes on far as to pinch her nose which starts to annoy the hell out of her. The man doesn't just stop there, he continues to slander in front of her about her height, which starts to blow away her confidence in an instant, and she then predicts that there is only one man who can help her in this matter. While Alfonso writes Ariadne about her safety and placement, Ariadne writes him about joining the ball with her and surprisingly, Alfonso has accepted her offer to do so in an instant which surprises her as she doesn't recall ever receiving such unconditional kindness before. Meanwhile, Cesare's mother brings in the topic of Ariadne having a debutante ball soon and starts to slander her name after hearing that Ariadne is about to be accompanied by the nephew of Lucrezia while her own son will be superior without any kind of doubt. It seems that his mother is quite interested in making Caesar join the debutante ball, but it seems that he finds it rather problematic. The moment his mother starts to protest his acts, Caesar leaves the room with his coat as the woman slams her wine glass on the table in anger swearing that she will make it happen anyways, no matter what happens. At the same time, Isabella ends up hearing that Ariane is about to have a dress made by Rajan which continues to make her wonder how Ariadne was able to achieve such a service. It makes Isabella conspire when the time comes to ball by choosing a white dress, even though it is only customary for the debutante and her partner to be the only ones dressed in white. She makes a plot to act on her actions by claiming that her sister wanted her to dress in some matching clothing as they are quite close so Ariadne isn't able to outshine her at any cost. Both her maid and Isabella continue to conspire about how to make it quite problematic for Ariadne and soon Isabella gets the idea of tinkering with the breast pads Ariadne wears with all the dresses thinking that it will cause problems for her. Then on the day of the debutante ball, Ariadne is looking quite the gorgeous woman while shining greatly in front of everyone. Sancho the maid then presents hooks in front of Ariadne for the bindings as they are normally used for keeping the bosom pads in place while Maria continues to sweat in fear knowing that Sancha isn't being truthful at all. Soon people call out to Ariane saying that her partner has arrived, and she starts to get prepared quickly thinking that Alfonso is there already. Soon Ariane and Alfonso meet both wearing white dresses and both of them continue to stare at each other as if they are watching each other for the first time in their life. While both of them are talking to each other, Zenobi de Rossi barges into the room and soon realizes that Ariane is about to replace him with none other than Alfonso. But when Zenobi doesn't seem to know any kind of manners and even points his finger at Ariadne, Alfonso ends up grabbing his hand to teach him some manners as Ariadne already has a partner for the ball. Zenobi even goes as far as to throw a punch at Alfonso. And at that time, Alfonso reveals his sword to dare the man to make a move on him. The rascal then plops down on the ground yelling, and at that moment, Ariadne orders his cousin to introduce himself as he is in the presence of Etruscan's heir, His Highness Prince. 
Alfonso de Carlo. After realizing what kind of crime he has committed, Zenobi starts to introduce himself by kneeling down to Alfonso and asking for his forgiveness. But when Alfonso notices that the man wouldn't have remorse if he wasn't a prince, he then commands Zenobi to apologize to Ariadne with full proof explanation, and Zenobi then decides to kneel down to both of them before leaving. Then for some reason, Alfonso looks down and it seems that he is quite sad after knowing how Ariane is treated in her own home. He then reaches to touch her face saying that she doesn't have to stand for this while naming her a true wonder of the world. Then when Alfonso apologizes to her by remarking on the fact that he might have ruined his hair, Ariadne starts to laugh after noticing the simplicity of the prince. Soon the debutante hall is about to be started, the cardinal commands everyone to extend a warm welcome on behalf of his second eldest daughter, Ariadne, while holding a wine, glass in his hand. Ariadne and Alfonso then make themselves present in front of the whole crowd inside and at the same time. Isabella starts to burn in jealousy after noticing Alfonso with Ariadne. But while a royal introductory message is about to be presented, Caesar enters the hall with an announcement letter in his hand claiming that he is about to be presented as her partner for the debutante hall which surprises Ariadne as she wasn't expecting something like that to happen even in her wildest nightmares. Even though Caesar can be seen representing himself as the partner for Ariadne's ball, it seems that the only reason Caesar is doing this is that he was ordered and forced by his mother. But when he notices that Alfonso is the man accompanying her to the ball, he suddenly starts to get interested in it as he desires to ruin their day. He then announces that he was advised by the king himself to accompany Ariadne and after completing his lines, he goes on to raise his hand for Ariadne as he is ready to take her hand for the dance claiming that he just wants to complete the order of the king. When Alfonso detects the deepening of the situation, he starts convincing Ariadne that she will be fine from then on and goes on to bid farewell to her which makes Caesar smirk on his own as if he is conspiring something. When Caesar starts dancing with Ariadne, he is quite impressed to see her from up close as he didn't expect her to be so suited up and classy. He then begins promising then how he will start acting nicely with her, but her answers make him realize that she isn't like the other women. He then starts thinking how thrilling it will be for him to steal her away from Alfonso as she is his sole love interest. At the same time, Isabella notices Alfonso standing all alone and Isabella goes on to drop the vase to make it look like he asked her to dance with him in the public. When Alfonso grasps the situation further, he doesn't have anything else to do in his ability, so he ends up agreeing to her proposition. Isabella starts conspiring against her sister to Alfonso, but he isn't a kid who can be swayed that easily which angers Isabella a lot. On the other hand, as soon as the dance ends, Ariadne runs away from Caesar to meet. Alfonso once again as the waltz is about to begin, when Alfonso meets Ariadne once again, he asks for her hand to begin the waltz with her as he knows that she will agree, and it happens accordingly. Then while dancing, Alfonso claims that he couldn't realize the beauty of Isabella as he only could talk about her having a resemblance to her sister. When they are ready to take the dance to the next level, suddenly the breast part of the dress rips out which astonishes them both. The moment her dress rips apart from the middle, Adrienne couldn't help but wonder, thinking that now the whole audience can see her bosom in front of them. But as soon as the incident occurs, Alfonso covers her dress with his jacket to get her to the powder room, but Adrienne instructs him to take her to the second room. As soon as they get inside the bedroom, the maids hurry up to help Adrienne as she is badly in need of their assistance. While Alfonso tries to help her with mental support, Adrienne starts trembling remembering what had happened in her previous life because of the comments and remarks made by the general public. When she begins to sob all alone, Alfonso goes on to give her some mental support, but he is also unable to do so. But after getting some courage on his behalf, he then goes on to hug Adrienne to console her, making her believe that everything will be all right as he is beside her. Adrienne then starts to feel better, but she is still in shock thinking that everyone had seen her out and open. Alfonso tries to calm her down by praising her beauty, but Adrienne doesn't seem to understand. Then when Alfonso elaborates on her beauty, knowing the reasons for him to cover her body as he didn't want anyone else to see her. Suddenly, Alfonso gets up from his seat claiming that he has overstayed and leaves the room to let her have some privacy. While Adrian contemplates what has happened, Alfonso tries to keep himself calm knowing that he has to suppress his urges to stay as a gentleman. 
On the other hand, noblewoman continued to discuss the unfortunate events and Isabella is still unsatisfied with the fact that it wasn't fake bosoms made out of foam that came out in the open. Knowing that she has to dirt on Adrienne's character, Isabella claims in front of everyone that Adrienne might have done it intentionally, blaming her desperation which starts to make everyone talk. When the women around Isabella continue to put dirt on Adrienne's name while including the name of Alfonso in the list, Alfonso instantly calls Isabella out on her jealousy. Isabella then tries to blackmail Alfonso with her innocent look, which gets supported by the women around her and Isabella continues to feel like she is about to get embraced by Alfonso soon enough. As Isabella starts to sob in front of the whole crowd of nobles, Alfonso falls into a great dilemma as he doesn't know what to do anymore and Isabella continues to keep her act of being a sobbing innocent noble lady, so Alfonso gets forced to console her. Then when Alfonso is about to approach Isabella to console her, she starts to think that her planning is going well according to the results, but the moment the situation is about to go further, Adrienne enters the room having even more emanating aura around her, which astonishes the crowd. At that moment, Adrienne approaches her sister to ask what made her cry this way, and when Isabella doesn't go on to answer, Adrienne repeats her question which gets followed by again a hollow drama created by Isabella. It seems that Isabella is trying to sway Adrienne's mind about the things she said about her body, so she starts to sugarcoat her words to make them more appropriate to Adrienne, which starts to awestruck Alfonso as well. But Adrienne isn't someone who can be manipulated this easily, so she directly questions Isabella about how she could say those things about her body while sobbing at the same time to flip her own game on her. Now this time, Adrienne is the one who is getting on the nerve of Isabella claiming that she is scared and everything mentioning that she doesn't want the sort of dirty praises that makes people look at her in a different way. The whole drama starts to make people talk about the whole incident and they paint Adrienne as the victim once again and they begin to shame Isabella considering that she must be the main culprit who wanted to harm her younger sister. People even start to mention that maybe the reason for being a half-sister manipulated her into doing something like that which is regarded as despicable by everyone. Then Isabella states that that isn't what she meant and the moment she is about to touch. Adrienne's hand, she moves away saying that even though she might be her half-sister, the whole incident is too shameful and mean toward her since she did everything to be a good sibling to her. When Adrienne starts to walk away from Isabella, she starts calling her back saying that the whole thing was a big misunderstanding but her way of approaching things doesn't work as the nobles behind her start talking about her activities. They can now predict that Isabella matched each other's clothes out of spite as the whole incident is now transparent to everyone. Then they begin to discuss how Isabella was the one to spread the embarrassing news as she claimed that her sister tore her dress because she enjoyed receiving the attention which paints Isabella as a wicked person who would do anything to go against her sister. As people continue to talk about it, Adrienne is seen smirking devilishly, moving away from the scene as she can now guess that her plan surely worked in the end. The moment? Adrienne reaches the stairs of the second floor, Isabella approaches her once again calling from behind, and the moment she notices that Adrienne didn't hear her, she starts haggling with her by holding onto her hand while cursing her by saying various names. Isabella is trying her best to confront her sister claiming that she made up lies about her, and the moment she tries to raise her hand against Adrienne, Adrienne grabs her hand, almost instantly to call her names whispering in her ears to show her true color. Adrienne even wishes that Isabella can die any time she wants and warns her to be careful the next time as there are chances that she will be hurting herself if she ends up crossing the line, which gets Isabella quite speechless. She has nothing more to do than curse in Ariadne's name. Sometimes later, Isabella is seen contemplating her choices as she predicted that Adrienne would never utter a word against her, but now all her dreams are crashing down on her head. She realizes that she will have to make a move as well, and it will be by using her countless friends. By using them, Isabella thinks that Adrienne will be completely isolated from high society. Then Isabella goes on to cry directly to her friends to let them know about her bad luck and everything so they can instantly start consoling her for it. She starts telling them how Adrienne was the one who wanted her to wear a white dress, and she doesn't know why the others are talking about it as if she wanted to do it herself. Isabella then adds that she even lent her clothes to Adrienne and helped her to adjust to San Carlo, and not only that but also, she even helped her in her studies asking if she didn't give much effort to her. People around her start consoling Isabella saying that she got betrayed by Adrienne because of having Alfonso as the guest as she is jealous of her. 
But while the whole scene was unfolding, someone wasn't having much fun watching. Isabella plotting against her sister who has no knowledge of the background whatsoever. The moment Lady Valdezar calls out to Isabella saying that she can see the straps that support her breast pocket, Isabella yells out gasping and calling all of her friends traitors for revealing her. Then Lady Valdezar approaches Adrienne to invite her to the tea party that she is about to hold at her house the next week, and Adrienne couldn't believe that she is living in reality. Right now as it never happened before in her whole life ever, Adrienne immediately accepts her invitation and states that she will be looking forward to the event gladly. In the next scene, the Cardinal looks shocked after knowing that 300 ducatos will be cost. For a simple ball and 500 ducatos for an extravagant one and the fact that he only let. Adrienne have only 150 ducatos to prepare for her ball starts to feel obscene to him. But not only that, the most shocking thing is that Adrienne managed to save 12 ducatos in the end while 150 wasn't enough when it comes to the ball and everything. Then Adrienne leaves the detailed ledger to her father obediently, and the cardinal is shocked to see that Adrienne can create a ledger in the first place as he never taught her how to create a ledger. She then elaborates that she found a book in his study room, so she followed and tried to make over it from there. After hearing that, the cardinal immediately orders someone to call Lucretia into his room, and she is in a dilemma about being called in all of a sudden. At the same time, Lucretia is confused to see Adrienne behind her, and when she finishes looking back at Adrienne, the cardinal demands her answer about how she had been managing their money, but as the cardinal has never asked this sort of question, she is astonished since the man has never interfered with household affairs. But then the idea of him getting an idea of his husband realizing that she had been pickpocketing money for her family back home starts to take a heavy toll on her. The cardinal then brings up the fact amount of money her wife used for Ippolito's farewell party last time even though there were only a few guests. To begin with, she still went, over 5,000 ducatos without taking permission from him. Then he also brings up the fact that she used 50 ducatos just for Isabella's dress for the ball. Instead of backing down, Lucretia claims that it is natural for someone to use up that amount of money while hosting a party, and to back up her statement, she starts adding, the fact that it has been 20 years since she started managing the household affairs so he should have some confidence to trust her. Feeling that yelling might get her better foot ground, she starts remarking on the idea that now he cannot have the level of trust in his own wife, and at that moment, the cardinal fires up remarking that she should be the one repaying the trust he has given her up until now. He starts elaborating how Ariadne managed to host a ball with 138 ducados as it just tells him how extravagantly she had been spending their family money. The amount of 138 ducados starts carrying a heady mark inside her mind and the cardinal, makes the decision to have Ariadne directly manage her own expenses, while Isabella isn't allowed to spend more money than Ariadne either. But Lazretia isn't about to take it. All in since she doesn't think that it is fair for him to let Ariadne have a fraction of her authority since she considers Ariadne as a concubine's daughter. She starts blaming the cardinal that he isn't willing to consider herself as his wife right now as she starts bringing up the fact that Ariane is nothing else than a bastard's child to her so she cannot have permission to deal with family finance. Instead of listening to the blabbering of Lucretia, the cardinal shouts at her saying that she must not have him repeat his words, while ordering her to get out of the room, making his decision final. Lucretia starts to think that the main culprit in this whole thing is Ariadne and starts to look at her narrowly, but ends up leaving the room, knowing that she isn't about to change. The situation anyhow right now. As she leaves, the cardinal starts discussing the matter of what happened during the ball and asks Ariadne if she thinks that there was an issue with the dress shop to know about her opinion on the incident. Ariadne starts becoming honest, with her father stating that the incident started to arise after she received the dress, and she adds that she will be looking into it further so she can inform him about it later. Before finishing the conversation, the cardinal suggests that she should be knowledgeable, enough when it comes to managing her subordinates, and advises her to be careful in the future. But above all that, the cardinal announces that she will be receiving ten ducados every month going forward from now on as a reward from him personally, so she can manage her own finances, which makes Ariadne feel that she might have gotten to the first checkpoint of her mission as she now has a fraction of Lucretia's authority. Then while Ariadne is having a conversation with her maid, she asks Ariadne why she didn't think of letting the cardinal know about the reality behind the dress incident, and Ariadne remarks on the fact that they don't have any definitive evidence just yet. It seems that when the ball ended, both of them thoroughly examined the dress as there were two questionable points. 
The first one is that the hook was made from silver and the second. One is that there were traces that someone had deliberately torn off the thread that was sewn up front of the dress, which made it easy to rip the dress even with the slightest pull. Even though Ariadne believes that Isabella must be the one who is behind this whole incident, she doesn't have any kind of evidence that will be enough to convince her father. She then suggests to her maid Sancha that they should start gathering evidence one, by one which will be enough to destroy Isabella with one critical hit. At the dinner table, the cardinal announces that the incidents that happen inside the house cannot be leaked to the public and suggests to Ariadne that she cannot criticize her sister Isabella in front of the public even if she makes a mistake in the first place. Ariadne realizes that the cardinal is mad since he got a fraction of the idea that they do not get along so Ariadne decides to play defensive and promises him that she will be more careful in the future so it doesn't repeat ever again. Then the cardinal brings up the topic to Isabella asking her why she would start blabbering about her younger sister's body since a fully grown lady should know when to speak and when not to speak especially when it is about their younger sister. Instead of clarifying the incident to her father, Isabella starts crying in front of the dinner table stating that she didn't say those things blaming it on Camellia, who questioned that Ariadne might have been the one who made the incident occur intentionally. After hearing that, the cardinal gets confused and Lucretia roars saying that he should be believing his daughter more instead of listening to the others while embracing the devil, Isabella calling her pitiful. Then when the cardinal gets excited shouting that he might have misunderstood the situation, Frightened Arabella ends up dropping her food on the table which makes the cardinal remark her activity as filthy and dirty. Even her own mother despises her actions when her father starts walking away without eating because of her and starts moving on her own with Isabella. As Arabella starts to cry, Ariane comes in the middle to calm her down while suggesting that she can eat it slowly and head upstairs afterwards stating that it isn't her fault. Arabella calms down after feeling the warmth of Ariadne's love and agrees with her opinion, so she continues to eat calmly. Meanwhile, Prince Alfonso is called into his mother's chamber for attending to the debutante ball of Ariadne, and as the situation gets tense between them, the queen hands him over a report of the Valo Grand Duchy of the Gallico Kingdom and its daughter. Larissa de Valo who sent a marriage to a proposal to him recalling being his engagement partner. The name Larissa starts to take so much of a heavy toll on Alfonso that he gets speechless all of a sudden as he has never even met the woman in his whole life. That his mother informs him that the Gallico Kingdom's diplomatic delegation will be visiting the next month since they are interested to talk about the marriage proposal in person, the main reason for Alfonso to be in his best behavior possible, so they can prevent the rumors about Alfonso being too close with a lady of some house in the kingdom. But even after hearing all of his mother's words, Alfonso remarks that Ariadne isn't some lady from some house, so she cannot just make her fall into that category. Alfonso also states that if she wants to blame someone for the debutante ball incident, he has to get blamed as well since he attended the ball without her permission in the first place. After hearing that, the queen starts to lash out at Alfonso since he isn't someone normal and the sole heir of the Etruscan kingdom, which is the reason he cannot be positioned with any woman. The queen then starts to elaborate on his fixed partner, who is also at the marriageable age, having a great reputation, and if the whole scenario causes some kind of bad effect on Ariadne for the impossibility of their marriage, he would be the one blamed for it in the end. She then insists Alfonso that they should immediately stop sending letters to each other and meeting alone whenever they want from now on, before the matter gets even more serious in the future. In the next scene, Ariadne can be seen getting welcomed by her newly made friend on the debutante ball ceremony. The moment she arrives inside the mansion, she starts to wonder what kind of discussions the ladies might have in a tea ceremony, which starts to take a toll on her wondering if she can cope around with these women. The moment she enters the place, she starts hearing one of them crying and yelling, wondering if the person she loves is about to marry her or not despite the fact that she and her partner are both already engaged. Ariadne takes it lightly knowing that these are the conversations. The ladies might have in their prime, so she should take it all lightly. But the situation gets serious for Ariadne when she starts hearing the name of Isabella. She starts to listen to it more closely. It seems that Isabella has ruined her relationship with her partner as the man was enchanted by Isabella rather than taking her side at that time. Ariadne realizes that Isabella is going so far as flirting with her close friend's man, while doing her best in high society which is quite impressive. Ariane suggests the lady not to worry as she is merely messing with him, which startles the lady as she wasn't expecting to see Ariane in the party. 
Ariadne then adds that Isabel will start running away if her man approaches her, as she just loves their attention in the first place. Ariadne knows that she craves for attention, but when the situation gets serious, she will retreat and run away, knowing that she cannot handle the heat. The same thing was done to Caesar in her previous life. The lady starts to get better, and she thanks Ariadne for comforting her, praising her for her humbleness, while Ariadne considers it all as her sympathy. Then the lady starts to praise Ariadne for being such a nice sibling to Isabella, and she wonders why Isabella would talk so badly about Ariadne. The lady then exclaims saying that only if she knew about Ariadne before, she would have stopped Isabella beforehand. Surprised, Ariadne asks her what she is talking about, and she then starts to reveal the truth stating that Isabella was the one who spread the lie, that Ariadne intentionally ripped her dress for everyone to look at her. Not only that but also, Isabella spread that Ariadne liked to show her breasts, and for the first time Ariadne realizes how toxic her half-sister can be. The lady doesn't stop there and elaborates that Isabella secretly wears breast pockets to make her breasts look bigger, as she as she thinks that Ariane likes to show off her breasts. When Ariane gets the whim of the whole incident, she learns that the lady is even eager to betray her own friends to get close to her one way or another. As she already knows, people like her would like to get close to someone one day just to stab her in the back. Someday so she cannot trust any of them in this whole scenario. But Ariadne is satisfied to learn what kind of place it really is since it might be useful to her someday. After learning the whole theory behind it, Ariadne uses her chance to reveal the truth of what Isabella said to her father about Camellia and everyone including Camellia starts to react after learning that. Camellia couldn't comprehend that Isabella would end up making such a lie about her and Adrienne starts to use the option of using her sister's enemy against her and she is happy with the fact that she ended up making Camellia hate Isabella, which might be useful to her in the future. Meanwhile, Caesar questions Octavio how to seduce some woman who doesn't like him, and Octavio is surprised that Caesar would ask him such a thing, while he is the expert of all women-related things as he is the playboy of the capital. Then Caesar remarks how he has never chased a woman in his life before and women, always came up to him at first. Octavio starts to gasp while listening to him and suggests, him to going after the woman the old-fashioned way which is by sending flowers and gifts since there is no woman who would reject flowers and gifts. It makes Caesar realize why Otavio isn't the popular one around women which causes him to start reacting. Then in the next scene, Isabella is surprised to see that Caesar sent flowers to the house for her. It seems that Caesar also sent some dresses to the house and Isabella gets excited to see them as they were made by Collision Boutique which is her favorite one in the town. The moment she learns that it was all sent by Caesar himself from the men, she starts to blush suggesting that they should bring the roses up to her room while she starts trying on the dress immediately. But after hearing that, the man who came along with those things starts to stutter to remark that he sent all of those things for Ariadne instead while Isabella starts to snap after hearing that. The men then reach Ariadne with the gifts and roses and she is having a tough time accepting that Caesar would do such a thing for her. It seems that the guy also sent her a letter to her which is full of appraisal and appreciating words for her as they shared the dance together in her debutante ball. But instead of being happy, Ariane's mood goes to waste remembering her prior experiences with him in her previous life and how he always went so far as to resemble her as something cheap which can be found anywhere on the street. She learns that now that the circumstances are different, he is treating her differently this time. She suggests the men take all of those things back to Caesar instantly as she doesn't want to have any kind of relationship with him. Then the man starts elaborating on the fact that the roses will wilt as they are real and when the man keeps on suggesting she should take the roses, she accepts but her opinion about the dress stays the same till the end. But she also adds that the man can keep the roses away and outside of the room, so it is out of her sight after all while having a serious look on her face. When the roses are kept outside of the room, Arabella is quite impressed to see such lovely roses full of a beautiful bouquet and Isabella is losing her mind over the fact that those gifts weren't for her and starts reacting badly to her younger sister. When Arabella moves away, Isabella starts to contemplate the fact that Julia hosted a tea party excluding her and then Ariadne was the one who was invited instead of her and now Caesar sent all of those things only for Ariadne and not her while she was getting proposed by him a while ago. She is annoyed by the fact that how can someone so pretty as she be ignored, while Ariadne is treated like she is some kind of goddess. Then while Isabella is losing her mind over all of those things, her brother approaches her asking what is on her mind, who is the same loser Zenobi from the previous incident that happened a while ago. 
Isabella starts to explain what is happening, and after hearing all those things, the man starts to act like a white knight keeping his shield in his hands, and thinks of teaching Ariadne a lesson. Zenobi starts to think that if someone like Isabella is treating him nicely, he can now boast about it all to his friends back home and besides. He thinks that there is a way for him to have a kiss from Isabella out of all this. Meanwhile, Arabella is mesmerized to know that Ariadne is about to attend the hunting competition and asks her whom Ariadne thinks will be winning this time. Arabella hopes that a handsome knight wins when she attends the hunting competition once she is older, as she will surely hand over her handkerchief to that knight as she dreams of marrying a handsome and courageous knight. Instead of barking like Isabella, Ariadne appreciates her thoughts as there will be nobles of high status sharing idle talks in their tents, while the young men head out to catch the prey. Then in the end, as a form of admiration for the winner, the ladies would hand over their handkerchiefs, but even if they are not the winner, a lady can still hand over their handkerchiefs if they think that they are brave enough as the event is mainly based on the fact that good-looking men and women would frequently fall in love. While Arabella continues to dream of what is about to come in the future, Ariadne promises to herself that she will be helping her to meet the man of her dreams someday, so she doesn't catch the black play and die early like she did in the past life, which will surely change her destiny. Suddenly, a letter arrives for Ariadne, and when she thinks that it might be from Alfonso, she starts Arabella to reach for her time to have a lesson since her teacher would be arriving soon so she can read the letter alone. Since it is the first letter to her after the whole debutante hall incident, she wonders what might be written inside for her, but for some reason it is sent by Caesar, and she quickly rips the whole letter with her two hands, seeing the shamelessness of the man. It seems that Caesar is determined to attain victory at the current year's hunting competition, and he was interested in knowing if she would be handing her handkerchief to him if he ended up attaining the golden deer. When the scene unfolds, Sancha realizes the man knows about Ariadne attending the hunting competition, and it seems that she sent a horse saddle especially made with deer leather for her, but since she already knows that Ariadne isn't about to accept the gift, she goes on to send the gift back to him once again. On the other hand, Ariadne is frustrated to know that Caesar is still talking about the golden deer in this life as well, and she is quite sick of it as the habit of sending gifts to. Her is a regular routine for him, now while Alfonso didn't write a single letter ever since the day of the debutante ball passed. It makes Ariadne think of if something really happened to him, or if he really started to get disgusted after seeing her giant and atrocious body, which made him hate her in the end. Anxious Ariadne starts to clench her fists, wondering if she is really about to meet him at the hunting competition. Then soon the day of the hunting competition arrives and the king of the foreign delegation of Gallico arrives while the Tuscan king continues rubbing his mustache as the head of the kingdom's foreign delegation, Duke Mreyu, starts to praise the weather of the day. When the Etruscan Count Marquez proposes Duke Mreyu communicate while following the Etruscan conduct as they are an Etruscan, Duke Mreyu starts mocking the man while calling the Erdiscan a small country, which starts to create a frustrating situation for Alfonso who is almost speechless at that moment. Then to clear up the cloud in the whole conversation, Alfonso's father jokingly starts saying that it is hard for his son to get married and decides to have a toast while setting aside language issues and other personal matters, but Alfonso doesn't seem to have any entertainment in this whole incident. Meanwhile, Count Caesar was heading in that direction to attend the hunting competition, with his men while discussing the Artuscan Prince Alfonso attending the occasion. When the conversation goes out of the boundary, Caesar states that he will be heading all alone for the day so they shouldn't be following him since he has to find the golden deer. As his mates start to head in another direction, Ariadne is unfazed to see that Caesar still hasn't changed and never stopped looking for the golden deer after all. It seems that the tale of the golden deer goes a long way since it is said that if someone washes their body in the water of immortality, which is supposedly the water that the golden deer drank from, the person will gain charms that nobody can resist. And above all that, the person who attains the golden deer is said to ascend the throne, and when it comes to that part, Caesar from the past strongly held that claim. The man said that he claimed to have seen the golden deer when he was young, and the reason for him being so handsome is because he washed his face in the water of immortality. But Ariadne doesn't believe any of it. While she was in her own thoughts all this time, she suddenly notices Alfonso standing next to her, but instead of speaking a single word, he looks down at the ground. Ariadne believes that the reason he is acting like that is that they are in a formal event, so she starts to giddy up her horse to move away, but she soon realizes that there is nothing much to do for her. 
even though she wants to stay in the tent, but she knows that there are all of her art nymphs are present, so she thinks that it will be better for her to wander around the place instead. At that moment, Zenobi approaches her to have a conversation, but as she is already in a bad mood, she states that she doesn't have to say anything to him, she starts to move away. Suddenly, Zenobi starts to get rough saying that she is daring to act up without knowing her place as she thought of harassing his pitiful Isabella and he also adds that he will not be standing still if she does that one more time. After hearing that, Ariadne smirks as he is fussing over this because she knows that he is trying to look good in front of Isabella, but she is ashamed to see him doing such a thing, as she is his cousin after all. When he acts like he didn't hear at all, Ariane suggests he should mind his own business instead of minding others as he doesn't have a single Ducato to his name which shocks the man. As she starts calling Zenobi names, he deliberately yells at her demanding she should shut up, and when he starts to get enraged, he ends up taking his crossbow to shoot which ends up hitting her horse. As the horse starts to run like crazy in the wild forest, Ariadne starts to contemplate if she should jump from the running horse, and if she does, she knows that she wouldn't stay intact but even if she doesn't, she is about to jump off the cliff and die for sure. While Ariane is losing all her hope, she notices Caesar calling out to her suggesting that she should relax her legs and lean forward, but even though she follows his instructions, he realizes that isn't about to work the way he thought it would, so he decides to act. After suggesting that she should take her feet out from the stirrup, he ends up jumping away from her horse to embrace her, and they both fall off the horse as he ends up saving her in the end. As soon as Ariadne regains her consciousness, she starts to feel anxious about Césaire staying silent doubting about his well-being and not knowing if he ended up dying after getting hit while falling down on the ground. When she goes on to check his breathing, the guy starts to talk as if nothing happened to him while cracking silly jokes with Ariadne, but it seems that Césaire has already hurt his arm quite badly, so he states that he wants to lie down for a little longer. To make extend the joke even further, he makes a proposal to her saying that she can lie down on his hand as his arm is wide open already, but Ariadne feels like a cringe climbing down her spine. She suggests to him to stop joking around and get up otherwise. She would have to kick his arm to make him get up. When she goes on to hold his hand to make him get up, she realizes that his hand might be broken so she starts to rip her skirt's outer layer to patch his hand up so he can feel better while moving his hand. When he asks about her capability of medications, Ariadne states that she has a moderate amount of experience as she had to grow up on a farm in the countryside. She then starts to hurry up knowing that the sun will soon set and there is no way she wants to spend the night with him in the wild. As they start checking up on her horse, they realize that it is already dead, and Ariadne thinks that it might have caused the time the horse felt the abnormal shock in its neck. Suddenly, Césaire notices the crossbow bolt in the horse's body, and when he asks Ariadne about it, she decides not to answer, realizing that he might create a more complex situation after knowing about it. Caesar suggests she should talk about it on the way as they are about to have a lot of time together on the same day. Caesar suggests Ariadne get up in front of the horse, but she insists that she will be walking down the road so he can ride the horse himself. He doesn't get the point of why she would refuse to ride the horse, and unfazed Ariadne claims that she has her own reasons since she doesn't want to be in his arms while riding the horse because of the prior experience with him. But Caesar continues to make even more silly jokes about her spending the night with him which doesn't work at all on Ariadne since she already knows what she wants in the first place. Meanwhile, the Count of the Etruscan Kingdom is busy negotiating with the Gallicos, Duke since the one who was supposed to be Alfonso's companion was the Grand Duchess Suzanne, but now the situation is changed since the companion was changed from Suzanne to her little sister Relisa. But the Gallico Kingdom's duke isn't about to hear any excuses related to that since they can do nothing as Suzanne died in the most unfortunate way because she caught the plague. After her, her little sister Relisa dead. Velo was chosen as the suited companion for Alfonso in the end. At that moment, the Count claims that the only thing that is about to fix the situation is increasing the dowry from what was agreed upon before, and all they are asking for is twenty cannons, and the Gallico army's recipe for gunpowder so the offer will be more suitable for the Etruscan king. After hearing everything, the Duke thinks that they are thinking way ahead of themselves, since they are asking for both cannons and gunpowder recipe, but according to the Etruscan Count, he isn't the one who intended to buy the inheritance of Etruscan's seat of power though marriage so he cannot be the judge of that. But the Duke isn't about to budge from his position and only thinks that the Etruscan authorities do not think highly of Ralisa as if she isn't able to fill in for Suzanne. 
he makes a proposal saying that Relisa will personally be visiting the kingdom of Etruscan, so the Etruscan authority is able to judge her quality before they get into a relationship to be sure whether she is suitable to become a queen. On the other hand, as Cesare and Ariadne are both riding through the forest, he keeps on, insisting that they can be sitting together, but Ariadne sticks to her point so that doesn't happen. At the same time, Caesar is astonished to hear that her cousin would do something like that to her, no matter how angry he was based on that time situation, which almost ended up her killing her in the process. He suggests to her that she should have plunged a knife into Zenobi's horse beforehand, and he makes sure that from this time on, whenever she is in trouble, she can count on him as he will be arriving to solve all of her problems right away. As they continue to bicker on their way to the outside of the forest, they both notice the golden stag drinking tea from a nearby lake, which astonishes Ariadne so badly that now, all of her doubts have vanished in an instant. As she knows that the one taking the stag's head will be the king in the future, she notices Caesar glancing right at the stag as if he is targeting it. When she thinks that the guy will be leaving her to catch up to the stag, she starts getting off the horse so he can head into the stag's direction, so he can capture it. But it seems that the man is thinking otherwise, he isn't interested in catching the stag, since at that point he would have to leave her in the middle of the forest, and he doesn't want to do that. Exclaimed Ariadne asks why he wouldn't want that as he explained the whole fascination of him catching the deer in his letters, and Caesar starts making jokes about her reading all of his letters carefully. When Caesar notices that the stag is gone, he goes on toward the pond thinking that it can be considered the fountain of youth, and suggests that she can also watch herself with him thinking that her face might become beautiful because of it. As Caesar washes his face, Ariadne thinks that his face might sting after getting in touch with the water, and he confirms that it surely does. As Ariadne starts to wash her face, Caesar keeps on glancing at her face and takes the chance of kissing her forehead while she keeps on staring forward shocked. As soon as Ariadne has gasped at the situation, she reacts almost instantly, and Caesar starts showing various excuses to cover himself. Ariadne realizes that being mad at him for acting sneaky wouldn't work much while feeling annoyed by the whole incident. She suggests that they should depart right away before the sun sets, and Ariadne still doesn't let Caesar ride the horse with her, which feels quite stingy to Caesar for the fact that he was the man who saved her from her trouble. Meanwhile, as Alfonso is sitting inside the royal tent with his parents, he starts to wonder about Ariadne questioning himself if she personally went out to hunt on her own when she didn't seem like the type of person to enjoy that kind of physical activity. He then starts to wonder if she really went out to walk with some other man and clenches his fist, in agony, but that idea feels impossible to him to some extent as her demeanor for him was unique and unchangeable. He knows that Ariadne shows her feelings only to him so other men must not know about it, and at that time, the king's informant lets him know that Caesar didn't return, and when he learns about the information he immediately commands his men to look out for him in the forest as the sun is about to set soon enough. Then someone points in the direction of the forest saying that he has returned with someone and the person is none other than Ariadne. After seeing Ariadne and Caesar together, Alfonso is agonized inside and the king is satisfied to see that his son is fine so he runs up to his son while he represents his role for the king announcing that his arm is fractured so he cannot be properly greeting him the way he wanted. Then when the king questions him about his arm, Caesar lets him know that he was trying to save Ariane while she continues to look the other way. He elaborates on the situation of how some wicked person attacked her using a hunting. Crossbow which placed her in grave danger so he had to act up and if he wasn't there at the moment, it would have been a huge disaster. The king is shocked to learn about the situation, so he starts yelling at that moment. Questioning both of them how could someone commit such an atrocity in the sacred hunting competition. Even before Ariadne was about to say something, Caesar lets the king know about the man's identity as he is none other than the cardinal's wife's nephew, Zenobi. The king starts to roar after getting to know about the incident so he commands his men to bring him to him immediately and Zenobi is presented in front of the king tied up almost instantly. The king asks for the man's statement of the situation related to Ariadne, and the man starts to refuse the idea claiming that he could never do such a thing since he spent the entire time inside the tents. After hearing his statement, Ariadne starts to smirk on her own wondering how could he make such a false statement in front of her as if he is thinking quite lowly of her. At that time, Ariadne makes her presence visible in front of the crowd to make some statements about the incident, 
She points out the idea that Caesar commented how he didn't attack her with a crossbow whether that arrow hit her or missed her or hit the horse instead was never once mentioned before. As the crowd is now excited, Zenobi tries to calm the situation saying that it is all a huge misunderstanding, and while trying to keep the situation in his favor he continues to make up the more complicated situation for himself while Arian continues to provide more and more verbal evidence. Suddenly, Lucretia makes her entrance in front of the crowd to vouch for her nephew blaming it all on Ariadne announcing that she might have a grudge against him. As soon as Ariadne notices that Lucretia has joined in the confrontation, she is having a tough time deciding on what to do since no matter what, she is still her stepmother so she cannot be confronting her directly in public. When Caesar learns the direction of the incident, Caesar presents the arrow which has Zenobi's family crest as well as his name at the same time. Ariadne is confused to see that Caesar would make his presence clear to vouch for her, while Caesar keeps on elaborating on the situation and how Ariadne was a huge risk at that time. Even when it wasn't enough, Caesar brings up the fact that even he was about to die in that situation knowing that the king would react after hearing such a thing. While Caesar continues to help her, Ariadne promises to herself that even after all of these things, he wouldn't be gaining anything from her, ever. The king then starts to make a judgment on the incident considering everything that Zenobi has done, he gets sentenced to forty whippings, but Ariadne knows that such a punishment is only implemented for property damage, such as injuring a horse while fully ignoring the fact that Zenobi intentionally attempted to murder Ariadne. But then, king also states that Zenobi will be forever banned from being ordained as a knight, and when Zenobi starts to overreact, the knights continue to contain him as he starts to curse. Ariadne in front of the general public and nobles. Ariadne notices how Zenobi is taking such a situation that lightly considered that he wasn't granted death, she thinks that the man is such a garbage and waste of society. As soon as the judgment is made, Lucretia lashes out at Ariadne blaming it all on her while cursing her, but instead of reaching for Ariadne, she ends up falling backward, fainting, while Zenobi is being whipped by knights. After all that, Ariadne is having a tough time to make a decision whether to thank Caesar or not considering that he was the one who helped her in the end while confused Alfonso keeps on standing away from them as he doesn't know what to do in that situation as soon as Zenobi is inside the cardinal's mansion. He starts to interrogate the man about his intentions for hurting his own daughter, even though he had been providing for all of his expenses this whole timeline of twenty years. As Zenobi is interrogated, he ends up slipping the idea through his mouth and reveals that Isabella was the one who wanted him to do that which starts to spiraling the situation even more. Isabella instantly starts to state that Zenobi is lying through his teeth, commenting on the fact that he has already lied in front of the king so it shouldn't be a shocking thing to learn that he would also be lying at home in front of them. Then Zenobi claims how she was the one intended to teach Ariadne a lesson and Isabella starts to brag how he was the one who intended to do that at first. But instead of focusing on their loser-like bickering, the cardinal asks Isabella what was done to her by Ariadne that she ended up hating her that much with a serious look on his face. When Isabella starts to stutter, he starts to remark how much harm it has caused to Ariadne as she had to get rescued by some man in the forest and comments how no one would do that to their younger sister no matter how much they hate them. The cardinal announces that Isabella will now have to read the entirety of a historical book and finish writing a report on it, and until then, she will stay grounded inside the house. Then when Isabella gets speechless, he orders his men to drag Zenobi outside so they can cut both his arms and ankles while he starts to yell in fear and agony. As Zenobi's part gets resolved, the cardinal announces to Lucretia that he is a priest, which makes him unable to form his own family so there was no way he will be making. An announcement for her to make her his legally recognized wife, so he decided to take the best care of her instead just because he was grateful to her. But until today, he decides that he will no longer keep his eyes closed because of these obvious reasons as he knows that she had been secretly sending money to her own family. He remarks that he already knew about it way before, but he stayed silent about it since he was grateful to her, and announces that from now on Ariadne will be inspecting Lucretia's account book, so she will have to get the account book checked by her every week. Then he advises Ariadne that she doesn't have to keep her eyes blind just because she is her mother, and if she finds anything suspicious, she can bring up the topic to him, privately. As the cardinal moves away, Lucretia starts to react harshly to Ariadne calling her names, and Ariadne leaves the room to move on to her own to have a conversation with her maid, Sancha as she doesn't know what to do. 
Sancha is rather happy to know that it finally happened since she will now be able to get her some payback for all the unfair things that she done to Ariadne. After the incident is resolved, Ariadne is wiser seeing how the play can get flipped for each and every small reasons. Then a few days later, Sancha arrives to Ariadne with the account book from Lucretia, and it seems that even though she didn't have the intentions to get them checked, Sancha managed to recover them forcibly. Ariadne notices the state of the account book is horrible, and while checking on the books, she starts asking Sancha about the matter that Lucretia had been receiving a lot of letters recently. According to Sancha, it seems that Lucretia's family is constantly pestering her while demanding for their living expenses and ordering her to send more money for the pitiful and crippled Zenobi. It seems that her family is constantly berating her while telling her to end her life, and so on which is a total mess. Sancha also lets Ariadne know that the dear leather saddle that was returned back to Caesar by her has arrived to her once again from Count Caesar. When Ariadne gets to read Caesar's letter she starts to feel ecstatic inside her, and as she learns that he is talking about having a scar on his face because of their prior incident, she sends him a good ointment for scars along with a reply for him, while wishing him that he should create a happy family with some other woman instead of thinking about her. Ariadne decides to keep the letter and suggests Sancha to send the ointment back to Caesar along with the letter which surprises Sancha. She leaves three more letters for Ariadne, and it seems that it was Alfonso wrote to her who is ashamed of his father, for making the punishment despite the fact that Zenobi made a great crime while apologizing to her for not being able to see her in the hunting ceremony. He also invites Ariadne to the masquerade ball which is about to take place on October in the royal palace as he hopes that they will be able to catch up on each other at that time since he is missing her quite a bit and worried. Even though Ariadne admits that she had been reaching Alfonso ever since she came back in time to get out of the unfortunate events that happened in her previous life. After constantly meeting him, she even started to miss him at some point, but even so, it seems that Ariadne would never be able to make a place for him in her heart, no matter what. According to Ariadne, she thought of their relationship as a deal that benefited both of them as she would marry Alfonso and break away from her parental household so she could block Caesar's treachery and help Alfonso ascend the throne unscathed. This was her intention from the start and she even suppressed her sense of guilt and tried to get closer to him the second time she met him, she seduced him, but she ended up feeling butterflies while forgetting all about her guilt which turned into pleasure later. But now she has lost sight of her objectives after he let her heart be swayed by a single letter from Alfonso realizing that she had been a fool in love and fort that she had thrown. Everything away and given up on her life, Ariadne realizes that she has to get her axe, together and that she should be focusing on what she has to do as she makes up her mind, thinking that she will marry Alfonso in this life so he would be able to take her away from the Demir household. On the other hand, she will be able to prevent Caesar's treachery, but she won't be falling in love with Alfonso or with anyone else for that matter as she will secure the spot beside the king and become the queen which will be done for the sake of her freedom and safety. Meanwhile, in Lajon's dress shop living room, Lazarin seems to have a fit after conversing with Ariadne for some reason as she thinks that agreeing to her deal will be ruining the reputation of her dress shop, and at the same time she thinks that the cardinal will be cutting ties with them saying that she cannot give Madame Lucretia a rebate. Rebate works as returning a portion of the sales to the buyer, and if Lucretia received a rebate from the dress shop, it would be the same as buying a dress for less than what is written in the account book in the first place as it could be made into a secret fund. Ariadne knows this, and this is why if a close associate of Lucretia intentionally spilled a rumor that Lajuan's dress shop was offering rebates, she won't be able to resist trying it out since it is the only way Lucretia has to secure her funds, and Ariadne plans that she will secure evidence that Lucretia has been receiving rebates which will be crucial evidence to the Cardinal. Once the Cardinal's trust in her hit rock bottom, all the authority over the domestic economy of the Demer household will fall into Ariadne's hands. Harriet then remarks the fact to Lazion to make her notice that there has been a huge increase in promotion because she was wearing a dress from the shop and at the same time, even when the other dress shops asked her to offer her better deals, she had been rejecting them, which is all done to protect her relationship with Lazion's shop. Ariadne knows that if the incident gets reported, the Demer family will cut ties with the dress shop. However, Ariadne promises Lazion that she will continue to promote the dress shop through her as she might be able to expand her business with her help. 
When Lysingen asks about expanding the business, Ariadne advises her to open another store in someone else's name as it would be good if the items were garments used by servants and linen used at home. Ariadne remarks if the household affairs of the Demir family fall into her hands in the future, she would need an outsourcing agent to handle all the garments and linen. According to Ariadne, even though there would be less profit per item, it will become a completely new market for Lazion so she can secure the Demir household as a regular client and make her way through other noble families' households, since Ariadne will be helping her with that as well. The idea of the new arrangement sparks inside the mind of Lazion, and as Ariadne learns about it, she suggests Lazion contact her once she makes up her mind. Then a few days later, Sancha finds out that a fabricated purchase of the perfume on the day of 3rd August was made on behalf of Lucretia and Ariadne is proud of her to see that she can now read without having any issues. Even so, Ariadne remarks that she cannot be touching Lucretia's personal expenses even on purpose, which makes Sancha react as it feels unbelievable to her. Then Ariadne makes her take a look at the receipt from Lejeune's dress shop and commands Sancha to bring the closest servant to Lucretia to her, as she will have to set a mouse trap for her enemies. On the other hand, Caesar continues to read the boring letters sent by various noble ladies and continues to crumble them with his hand as they are too boring for his taste while he and his mates continue to poke through the piles of letters, and it seems that Caesar is even playing with the married ladies in the kingdom. His mate thinks that Caesar will be dying in the hands of a woman who would stab him in the back, and at that moment, Caesar was looking right at a single letter as a holy grail. The moment his mate goes on to touch it, he smacks the man which gets him even more excited, but even till the last moment, Caesar keeps it secret and goes on to write another letter for Ariane promising that he will even dedicate the whole kingdom to her. At that time, Alfonso makes a proposal to the count asking him if he could invite Ariane to the detached palace in the south, and the count feels like the whole sky is about to crash down on his head after hearing the words out Alfonso's mouth. He insists that Alfonso cannot have a female visitor at a time like this, and Alfonso thinks that it will be fine if it is a male visitor just so he could dress Ariane as a male so they both can spend quality time together. As Alfonso continues to daydream about it, he goes even further into his dreams as if they are about to spend their whole life together. He knows that even though he cannot invite Ariane specifically, he could meet her at this time at the masquerade ball after all. But the situation changes for him as he gets to know that Larry said is about to come to visit in time for the masquerade ball at the dinner table even though the ceremony is known to celebrate St. Michael's birthday. The king starts to insist that the princess really wanted to attend, and since she wants to get married to Alfonso, she is rather sweet to him. Then his mother remarks that Princess Velo is Alfonso's guest, and which is the main reason he should escort her throughout the entirety of the masquerade ball, and it only has to be him particularly and no one else so he can ensure that there would be no diplomatic issues. After going through the situation, Alfonso isn't ready to make another single comment about the situation so he only continues to answer his mother's statements positively. Then he starts writing a letter to Ariadne, letting her know that there will be someone else visiting from the Gallico kingdom, and he had been tasked with escorting the guest. During the masquerade ball, but he really wanted to see her after a long time. He apologizes to Ariadne for not being able to do so and lets her know that he will be sending another letter at a later date with regrets. Ariadne starts to feel like everything is continuing to happen just like in her past life, and the guest from the Gallico kingdom is Princess Larissa, who is Alfonso's prospective marriage partner. Even in the past, Larissa attended the ball and completely fell in love with Alfonso, but because of that specific incident, the marriage proposal turned to dust, which forced Alfonso to get married to Isabella. But according to Ariadne, it is fine if the woman is Larissa for some reason, and while she is conspiring to do something about her future, Arabella is poking around the room of Isabella. As soon as she enters the room, she is mesmerized to see that the room is filled with amazing and expensive jewelry, and after noticing them, she starts to wear each one of them continuously to try them on. At that time, she notices a hairpiece and realizes that the tips are amazing and the moment she clasps one of them on her hair, the maid starts to call out to Ariadne which gets her so scared that she ends up putting it inside some kind of chest to run away to check up on the mask that Ariadne ordered. Arabella goes on excitedly to check out the mask that Ariane ordered, but when she notices that the whole hall room was filled with a serious atmosphere, she starts asking Ariadne out about it. The moment Ariadne looks back wearing her scary mask, Arabella shrieks terrifyingly calling the mask quite ugly. 
Sancha also requests Ariadne not to wear. The mask and Ariadne starts to gasp after removing the mask since she cannot talk while wearing it since she has to bite on the clamp inside the mask to keep it in place. According to Ariadne, the mask is named Moretta Mask which is considered mute and Moretta, and when Arabella suggests she should order another one, Sancha states that they do not have enough time to make a new order. Ariadne starts to get into a tough situation, as she never thought that something like this would happen since she never used the same mask beforehand. As Ariadne is heavily dependent on her words, she is having a tough time wondering how she would have to keep herself quiet at the party. Soon after, a man comes in with a package and it seems that Count Caesar has sent something once again. But the moment she thinks of sending back the gift once again, she finds a gorgeous mask inside it for her which is supposedly a product of Collision, Boutique which is a piece that the Count paid good money for and had specially produced. Ariadne couldn't help but wonder why he would think of delivering the mask at the exact time. She knows if she accepts the gift, her worries will get delayed but there is always a danger in building up a relationship with him. When Ariadne wants to send the mask back to the Count, Sancha starts to manipulate her into keeping the mask remarking the fact that she will have to enjoy the ball till the end so she doesn't lose Alfonso. But Ariadne knows that this time Alfonso will be enjoying his time with Larissa anyway and she ends up accepting the gifts sent by Cesar anyway. Then when the ball day comes, Sancha and Arabella wish her to have a good time and dolled up Ariadne believes in herself, remembering that she should be enjoying her time for herself only. The moment Ariadne gets on the carriage, she realizes that Isabella is on the same carriage as her, and now she has to stick with her until they reach the palace without making a noise. Before they are about to leave, Arabella wishes them to bring home tons of fun stories for her and even though Ariane decides to act with optimism, Isabella doesn't say or do anything to assure her sister. When Ariadne takes a look at Isabella carefully, she realizes that Isabella is now wearing a mask that would be popular in two to three years so she couldn't help but acknowledge her sense of fashion as it is quite impressive. Also, as she is Isabella, she is always wearing dresses to stand out in the crowd, which will attract others for sure. Then Ariadne thinks to herself, that she excludes riding on a carriage with Isabella today. Nobody would be able to know her identity at all as people do not really have the knowledge to sense whom she is by looking at her outfit as her expressions are hard to read among the others. But somehow it feels like a breakaway to Ariadne for some weird reason. Meanwhile, Larissa meets with Alfonso and states to him that she has heard a lot about him from the others, and after saying that, she begins her introduction to Alfonso. As Alfonso introduces himself to Larissa, he assures her that they can continue communicating in Gallican if that would be more comfortable for her to keep her confidence. It seems that Larissa is trying too hard to get a grasp on her Etruscan language as her father is quite enthusiastic about their household education. But it seems that Gallican King was most considerable when it came to her sister Suzanne's education. For that reason, Larissa is thankful to her father that she learned a lot about literature, embroidery, music, and the arts. Then according to her, when it comes to literature and conversation skills, her sister, Suzanne was especially outstanding compared to her, and she was the best considering her looks as well. She also knows that people longed for her sister more than they did for her. And then Alfonso remarks that she also has beautiful white skin, so she shouldn't be talking about her sister so much to make her feel better. When he insists that she should be talking more about herself, Larissa feels like she is starstruck as all her life she grew under the shadow of her sister who excels in every aspect possible. Even though she loved her sister so much, she also resented her while on the outside she invited and praised her sister as everyone was only interested in her. As nobody was interested in hearing her stories, she just had to talk stories about her sister to receive their affection, but now, all her thoughts are changed just after hearing these words from Alfonso. For the first time, Larissa feels like someone is interested in her only and Alfonso just became her dream prince. She thanks her sister for dying as she promises that she will look good for the prince. She asks Alfonso if she can paint him in a still life painting as she likes painting flowers or vases in order to look good in his eyes. She starts to brag about herself letting him know that she even won a prize at the Freed Montpellier a few years ago and when he remarks that the award is only made for married women, she shrieks after knowing that since even Suzanne was awarded. As soon as Alfonso meets eye to eye with Ariadne, he almost goes speechless, and he asks Ariadne if he ended up meeting the right person hurriedly. After seeing Alfonso's ability to guess her identity, Ariadne asks Alfonso how he has gotten all the way outside, 
in the garden and Alfonso lies to her about the situation saying that he was strolling through the garden and ended up in front of her. Then Ariadne starts to wonder what might have happened to Larissa and even though she wanted to ask him that, she doesn't think that they do not have that kind of relationship, so she skips that matter. While she was having a hard time beginning their conversation, Isabella was sneakily looking at both of them through the bushes and guessed that Ariadne was having a secret rendezvous with Prince Alfonso. Meanwhile, as Caesar was walking down the stairs, he felt happy that nobody could find out his identity and thinks of the day as a great day, but he thinks that it is a pity that he has to cover his pretty charismatic face and accepts it anyways. He thinks that no matter what the situation is, it will be worthwhile for him to check how effective it is for the women around him. Suddenly, someone behind him calls him by his name, which shatters his dreams even in the beginning, and instead of hearing from the woman, he starts to head on while the woman starts to call him from behind recognizing his voice. He knows that he has to pretend like that even if he just met an old friend because this is the beauty of the masquerade ball. As he continues to stroll on his own, he knows for a fact that he hasn't been attending the ball ever since he was a kid. He reminisces about himself running through the garden as a kid the time when he hated his mother for scolding him all the time but instead he liked the queen as she always gave him snacks whenever he came to play. He would always happily head over to the queen instead of caring about her identity as he reminisces how the king used to love. Alfonso more while calling himself his only heir. As soon as he noticed the king playing with Alfonso, the king would head over to him to slap him on the face yelling at him and saying that he doesn't have the allowance to enter the royal palace as he wishes. He would scold him saying that he has to return to his mother and when he claimed that he wanted to play with his mother and father, he would always disregard the fact that he was his father after all. He would scold him so much that he would cry while looking down at the ground and even the queen started looking down on him. As Alfonso cried in shock, both the king and the queen would continue taking care of their son, making him remember that he doesn't have a single good memory inside the royal palace. While reminiscing through the past, he notices Alfonso and Ariadne, together making him realize that he isn't about to have any good memories of the place. Anyways, as the person whom he is interested in is with Alfonso right now. As Alfonso continues to have a chat with Ariadne, both of them hold hands together and suddenly, Caesar makes his entrance taking Ariadne's hand in his hand which shocks Ariadne. When Alfonso notices the unknown man, he suggests to him that he should better go away as he doesn't know him and at that time, the crown from his head falls down on the ground. At that moment, Caesar reveals his face expressing that he doesn't have to show his courtesy to the royal family as it is the masquerade ball. Both Ariadne and Alfonso are shocked that the unknown man is no one other than the Count himself and Caesar recalls how he doesn't find the occasion amusing as the prince told him to let go of Ariadne. He insists that the one who should be getting his hands away from Ariadne is indeed Prince. Alfonso and not him as he begins questioning him about Princess Larissa. Caesar advises him not to play with an innocent lady's heart to go look for his valued foreign princess and at that moment Caesar takes his hand over to Ariadne to come with him remarking the fact that she should let Alfonso go away. When Ariadne is having a hard time guessing about the state guest, Caesar shames Alfonso for not even telling her who the guest was in the first place. After hearing everything, Ariadne suggests to Alfonso that he should go on to look for Princess Larissa, and she is also about to accompany him in doing that. After hearing Ariadne, Caesar starts to react asking Ariadne if she doesn't feel mortified, asking Ariadne if she doesn't know that she cannot be with Alfonso since he is discussing marriage with the princess of the Gallico kingdom. Caesar tries to convince Ariadne to leave him alone, but Ariadne proves him otherwise saying that she doesn't have any kind of relationship with Alfonso which shocks Alfonso as well. Ariadne remarks that she was never asked out and she doesn't meet him with any kind of personal motive suggesting to him that he shouldn't be looking at their friendship in a bad light. After hearing Ariadne, Alfonso regrets her not telling her about his feelings and not elaborating on the matter of Larissa to her. As the conversation takes a difficult turn, Caesar introduces Ariadne as her admirer and even asks her hand in marriage considering that he will be sending a marriage proposal to her house in the early morning suggesting to Ariadne that she should send Alfonso away immediately. Thanks for watching the second part of Sister. I am the queen in this life. This will be all for today and if you want to support the channel just click on the subscribe button and ring the notification bell. Let us know in the comments if you want to see the next part of the manhwa. See you again next time.